Good morning from Council Chambers. If you just joined the conference link, could you please identify yourself? So we will uh, do roll call in just a moment here. Stand by. And welcome to the um, March 15th and, if necessary, continuing to the 17th City Council meeting. I will uh, roll call and then provide land acknowledgement that's a little different than usual, but I'll make sure everyone's here first. So, um, Councillor Banga? Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel? I can Good see morning. with my own eyes. Welcome. Morning. Uh, Councillor Katarina? Good morning. Councillor Zadek? Good morning. Councillor Essinger? Good morning. Councillor Hamilton? Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Henderson? Morning. Councillor Knack? Good morning. Councillor McKean? Good morning. Councillor Nickel? Good morning. Councillor Briquette? Councillor Briquette? Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Walters. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. So, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, which has been home to diverse Indigenous people for thousands of years. And we start our meetings typically with a land acknowledgement to help create awareness that we are, all of us here, are Treaty people and to show recognition and respect for Indigenous people, cultures, and traditions. Last Monday, March 8th, was International Women's Day. And in honor of this date, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Indigenous women leaders who recently selected the various new ward names for our city. Indigenous cultures traditionally uphold women as leaders in their communities, which is why they were chosen to lead this initiative. This was an opportunity for reconciliation for matriarchs to reclaim their roles within the community. Together, they guided, directed, and gathered the wisdom and knowledge to help create a more inclusive and welcoming future for our city. And this committee of Indigenous matriarchs gifted traditional names to the city's naming committee to honor sacred places in Edmonton and to preserve the history of this place for future generations. The committee was made up of 17 women from First Nations in treaties number 6, 7, and 8, as well as Métis and Inuit leaders. And they represented the Anishinaabe, the Blackfoot, the Cree, the Dene, the Inuit, the Iroquois, the Métis, and the Sioux Nations. And it's thanks to these women that we can all work together to continue building a great city for today and for future generations that remembers that uh, this is traditional Indigenous territory. So, two for one International Women's Day and treaty acknowledgement, um, and that was uh, Councillor Essinger's um, approach to opening a meeting last week, which, which uh, I was happy to <coughs> reboot here at Council for this week. So thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Essinger, for inspiring that. Now, we need a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, there are two additions on your sheet, 611 council initiatives and 94 a legal update. And I've also got two more uh, verbals to add uh, that uh, I think the clerks have some wording for. So Councillor Essinger, if I could go to you, you'll see on the screen uh, the four items to add. Uh, one is a negotiation uh, approach update, a quick verbal, and uh, the other is um, an intergovernmental update on Bill 56 before the legislature, uh, which we can hear publicly just to get some orient <coughs> orientation and give some direction on response to that legislation. So those would be the additions to what's otherwise been before you. Councillor Essinger, if you'd move that. So I would move that the March 15th, 2021 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. Additions of 611 uh, Council initiatives 
612 Intergovernmental Update on Bill 56, 9.4 Legal Update, and 9.6 Negotiations Approach. Second. Thank you. Any questions? Not seeing any, please vote on the agenda with those additions. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Councillor Banga? Yes. Thank you. We have all the vote. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. The minutes, Councillor Knack? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the February 22nd, 2021 City Council meeting, from the February 23rd, 2021 City Council public hearing, and from the March 4th, 2021 City Council non-regular meeting. Seconder? I'll second. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Any questions, concerns, errors, or omissions? Not hearing any, please vote. Oh, yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Councillor Zadek? Yes. Thank you. We have all the vote. Thank you. Display the vote. Please. Carried. <clears throat> Protocol items. We have several today. Uh, first up is Councillor Katarina. Oh, good morning. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, today, we are really uh, pleased to say hello and welcome uh, to the grade three class from Virginia Park School, which is located in my ward, Ward 7. They and their teacher, Sarah DeVry, are starting their week with us, and uh, we couldn't be happier. Welcome and enjoy your upcoming week with City Hall School, and I noticed that uh, Ms. Esther Brooks is with us this morning as well too. So uh, welcome to her as well. So thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, a welcome for the uh, children. Great to have you here, even virtually, um, Virginia Park students and, and uh, Ms. DeVry. Um, next, uh, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the National Day of Observance for COVID-19. It is hard to imagine that we've been navigating this virus for an entire year. Past years required self-sacrifice at so many levels. Parents had to figure out how to work from home while helping their children with schoolwork. Hundreds of people have lost their jobs and even more people have struggled with their mental health. Edmontonians were forced to miss key life events, many separated from friends and family, and too many lost their lives. To date, more than 1,900 Albertans have died as a result of COVID-19, including 811 of our fellow Edmontonians. And so I want to take this opportunity to honor those whom we've lost, but also to express my gratitude to the frontline workers who have been at the forefront of this battle since the very beginning. To our healthcare professionals on the front lines, civic workers keeping our city running, grocery and retail employees ensuring we all have the necessary supplies we need on a daily basis. To everyone who's put themselves out there over the past year, thank you. Thank you for your ongoing work, your courage, and your inspiring resiliency. And I also want to thank, on behalf of this council, Edmontonians themselves, every single one of them. I know the past year has been a struggle for all of us, and that everyone has had to make incredible sacrifices to keep our loved ones and each other and our community safe. I know it hasn't been easy, but the pandemic could have been even worse without this collective cooperation. And while this pandemic is far from over, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And with the incredible advances in science and technology that we've seen, the arrival of vaccines around the world has undoubtedly allowed many of us to sigh in relief. And so we're starting to win this long battle against COVID-19 as more and more Albertans receive their vaccines. 
And that said, now more than ever, we need to continue working together to adhere to the public health guidelines so we can continue to save lives and decrease our COVID numbers, especially with the variants loose in the community. So Edmonton has been tested, but COVID has not and will not break us. As we look towards recovery out of this pandemic, I want Edmontonians to rest assured that City Council and City Administration will continue to work together with our partners, our stakeholders, our government counterparts, and with Edmontonians themselves to ensure that we emerge from this pandemic stronger and more resilient. So given the loss of life over the last year, I think a moment of silence would be appropriate. If you'll join me in that. Thank you. Next up is Councillor Zadig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for that last item. I'm pleased to recognize the 408 Tactical Helicopter Squadron on both its 80th anniversary of formation and its 50th anniversary being stationed here in Edmonton. The squadron was first formed in Lindholm, Yorkshire, as part of 5 Royal Air Force Group on June 24th, 1941. On January 1st, 1971, it became a tactical helicopter squadron at Canadian Forces Base Nemeo. Equipped with CH-146 Griffins, the squadron's primary role is helicopter support to the Canadian Army and other government departments. The squadron has been heavily involved in domestic operation, operations such as the floods in Winnipeg and Calgary, G8 summits in the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Games, and forest fires throughout Western Canada, including the devastating forest fires in Fort McMurray 2016. Personnel from 408 were deployed in Iraq as part of Operation Impact almost continually from 2017 to 2020. Concurrent with this support to operations in Iraq, 408 was also deployed in Mali in 2018 to support operations presence. There, the unit's Griffins helicopters provided aerial arm support to the Chinook helicopters, which acted as flying emergency operating rooms, transporting injured UN soldiers to medical safety. 408 Squadron remains ready to serve on future domestic and foreign operations, providing tactical helicopter support as required. So now I would like to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Dave Forbes, Commanding Officer of 408 Squadron, to share a few words on the significance of this double anniversary. Lieutenant Colonel Forbes. Oh, you're muted, sir. Okay, good morning. There we go. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Councillor, and uh, good morning to you, Mayor Iveson, and to the rest of the Council. And thank you for this opportunity to recognize 408 Squadron in our 80th year serving Canada and 50 years of being based here in, in, uh, in Edmonton. Uh, as mentioned, 408 began its service uh, in the Second World War, forming on 24 June 1941 in Lindholm, England, as a heavy bomber squadron. 408 went on to conduct 4,610 sorties over Nazi-occupied Europe, losing 146 aircraft with 877 of its aircrew, with a further 12 aircraft and 32 aircrew lost in accidents. Their sacrifice aided in the liberation of hundreds of millions of people while earning the squadron's 11 World War II battle honours. In peacetime, 408 squadron flew Lancaster bombers from Ottawa and was instrumental in photographing the entirety of the Canadian Arctic, generating the first accurate maps of our own country, while also patrolling offshore in the early Cold War. Our mission since arriving in Edmonton in 1971 has been to provide tactical aviation effects to the Canadian Army in the form of tactical mobility, aerial reconnaissance, and the application of firepower. Our tactical aviation operational history includes peacekeeping operations in the Sinai, Honduras, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, 
This unit was heavily involved in the war in Afghanistan, earning our 12th battle honor, as well as in more recent operations, as mentioned, in Mali and as late as last spring in Iraq. 408 is routinely uh, employed domestically for emergency response to floods, fires, search and rescue, and other disasters. Indeed, we're currently ready to support the government's COVID response in remote areas, if and when needed. 408 is also deployed on disaster relief operations abroad, notably the 2010 earthquake in Haiti and 2013 typhoon in the Philippines. 408 also occasionally conducts operations in support of law enforcement. Approximately one year ago, we dispatched two Griffin helicopters in support of an RCMP emergency response team rescue of a young woman allegedly being held against her will in northern Saskatchewan, lying in the middle of the night and in under two hours from being notified. 408 is proud to call Edmonton home. Thank you again for this opportunity. Go Oilers! For freedom. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> On behalf of City Council and the people of Edmonton, I'd like to extend my gratitude to 408 and all its members. The fact of sacrifices you make on a daily basis to keep peace here and around the world does not go unnoticed. And we in Edmonton are extremely proud to be your home base. <clears throat> Congratulations on these milestones. I look forward to the great work you continue to do into the future. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I thought we were going to need tech support for the air support there, but um, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us, um, uh, Colonel, and and to you and through you to uh, your colleagues. Thank you for that that storied history um, and and everything it represents about this country and the courage of the people who've served it uh, uh, under your banner and and under this country's flag over the years. Uh, and, and we're very proud to host you and have you as representatives of this community in this region. So thank you for your service and, and happy birthday. Thank you for your kind words, sir. Yeah, clap, yes. <laughs> These things are easier to do in person. The cues are, are, are all off, but um, but I think we're all smiling. So thank you for that, Councillor Zadik. That's wonderful. Um, next up, we have another birthday. Uh, um, a lot of birthdays today. Uh, Councillor Essinger is next. Well, it's not my birthday, but today's council recognition, uh, have you seen, is about significant anniversaries. Uh, particular ones that are taking place in our city. And I would like to take a few moments to recognize and congratulate Edmonton Public Schools on their 140th anniversary. And as a former public school trustee and board chair, I am very pleased to welcome our two guests from EPSB. This morning we have with us Trisha Esterbrook, the current board chair, and Cindy Davis, the manager of the EPSB Museum and Archives located at the historic Mackay Avenue School. Welcome. Edmonton Public School started as the first free public school in 1881, and it cost $968 to build and had the largest windows in the community. At that time, it consisted of one school, one teacher, and 28 students, with an early example of diversification with children from the Hudson Bay Company employees. Today, there are 215 schools, 9,500 staff, and over 103,000 students. By 1888, enrollment grew to 82 students, requiring an addition to be built to the existing schoolhouse. A year after that, in 1889, Lillian Osborne, the first female teacher, was hired. <coughs> She subsequently went on to teach for over 30 years at a handful of different schools around our city. In 1890, a night school program was added to cater to youth who could not attend classes during the day. The original schoolhouse actually sits on the same property as Mackay Avenue School. This is an incredible piece of history that we are so lucky to have preserved in our community and is a great place to see how far Edmonton Public Schools has come. To mark this milestone anniversary, a very clever engagement initiative was launched, 140 facts for 140 years, and was developed by the EPSB Museum and Archives. And these are being slowly released on Instagram over the year. 
Some of those 140 facts include. Fun fact number two was about Matthew McCauley, one of the first three school trustees, and he became Edmonton's first mayor and the first warden of Edmonton's first federal prison. Fun fact number seven. Remember those large windows in the first school? Well, the glass for those was shipped from Ontario and was packaged in barrels of molasses. And the story is that children were invited to lick the glass clean. And fun fact number 28. Queen's Avenue School became the first EPSB school to get an indoor washroom in 1904. Why are they lucky? Through the years, Edmonton Public Schools has continued to diversify and evolve to meet the needs of our ever-changing population. Language classes have expanded to include American Sign Language, Arabic, Cree, French, German, Hebrew, Japanese, Latin, Mandarin, Punjabi, Spanish, and Ukrainian. The division was the first school jurisdiction in Alberta and the Prairies to develop a comprehensive standalone policy and administrative regulation to support sexual and gender minority students, families, and staff. And earlier this year, Edmonton Public Schools formed an equity advisory committee, which is intended to reflect the division's commitment to work toward eliminating systemic racism and support equity in its schools. Teachers and administrators go above and beyond every day to help kids succeed, both inside and outside the classroom. I would now like to invite board chair, Tricia Estabrooks, to share a few words on this very impressive anniversary. Tricia. Thanks so much, Councillor Esslinger. And it means a lot, um, this dedication coming from yourself as a former board chair of Edmonton Public Schools. So thank you for that. And thank you to Mayor Iverson and, and city councillors for this recognition. The entire division and the Board of Trustees is, um, we're truly touched by today's acknowledgement as it marks uh, another chapter in our 140 year history uh, of Edmonton Public Schools. And the, the stories, I mean, Bev, I think you captured it so well. And I think um, in particular the story, uh, you can just imagine those children running down to witness those huge window panes, as you said, shipped in all the way from Ontario, packaged in barrels of molasses, and celebrating the arrival of those windows by licking those windows clean. I think it's such a testament to the history of our school division. There's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of innovation and creativity, strong leadership, immense growth, and as I mentioned, rapid change. But what hasn't changed in our 140 years as a school division is a steadfast belief in public education and keeping children at the forefront of what we do. Edmonton Public's history is an important one as it marks the beginning of public education, not just in our city, but in the province of Alberta as a whole. And the theme, as you mentioned, Councillor Esslinger, 140 years, 140 facts, is the work of manager Cindy Davis and her team at EPSB Archives and Museums. And we know about these fun little facts, including the window panes, because of, because of you, Cindy. Cindy, you've done an amazing job of telling our history um, to not just our division and to staff and students in our division, but to the rest of the city and quite frankly, anyone else on social media right now. So thank you. And so again, on behalf of the division and the board of trustees, thank you city council for this honor. And if I may, I'd like to invite uh, Cindy Davis to, to share a few words as well. Thank you, Chair Estabrook. Well, history comes alive at Mackay Avenue School and my staff are always more than happy to find ways to teach history. So this opportunity um, has been great for us. And teachers have told me that celebrating and reflecting on our past has been really positive this year in um, considering we've had a not so positive last year. So we're looking forward to continuing to teach 140 facts to everyone about the formation of Edmonton Public Schools, which of course crosses over with the city of Edmonton and the province. 
So thank you very much for this honor. Well, thank you very much, Cindy and Chair Estherbrooks. And I would like to say on behalf of City Council and actually all Edmontonians, congratulations on this milestone anniversary. Thank well, you. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Essinger for that and uh, Chair Estherbrooks and uh, Cindy. Uh, for for being here for us uh, Having some of the best public schools in the world is why we decided to raise our family here So uh, so that's that's absolutely worth celebrating 140 years of that. So so um, Happy birthday to you as well um, and last but not least One more birthday and This one's a big round number as well. We've got so many of these milestones uh, today, but um, one that is also an important pillar of our city is our Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. EFCL's roots technically date back to 20, uh, 1917 when Canada's first community league was founded in Crestwood. And over the next five years, eight more leagues opened their doors around the city and thus in 1921, EFCL was born. And at that point, Edmonton was a bustling young city of just 58,000 people. It's almost hard to imagine. But over time, as our city has grown, EFCL has grown with us. And over the past 10 decades, our community league system has become renowned as one of the strongest in North America. And today, there are 162 leagues across our city, each of which plays an essential role in the healthy development and long-term success of our residents, our neighborhoods, our youth, and our city as a whole. One of Edmonton's greatest features is that even though we're a city of a million people and still growing, we still maintain a sense of community and belonging. Edmontonians can enjoy a mix of small town charm with the conveniences of life in a major modern center. And part of the reason this works so well here is our strong community league system. This past year, our community leagues have played a vital role in keeping Edmontonians safe and healthy as well. Across the city, we've seen leagues work hard to support neighbors who've been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, whether that's by delivering groceries and supplies or shoveling walks or raising funds and donations for local causes like our food bank. As volunteer-run organizations, our league's success relies on more than 10,000 volunteers across the city who dedicate their time and energy into building healthier neighborhoods. So to celebrate this milestone anniversary, EFCL has some great activities lined up for the next few months. Every month throughout 2021, EFCL will be sharing a short film on communities in each of Edmonton's 12 districts. And there are two up so far, and it's a great way to learn about the league's legacy here in our city. A few months ago, I also had the chance to be part of, along with about half a council, the um, EFCL Community League Plaza opening down at Horlack Park. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, I really encourage you to go down. It's a just fantastic space for people to gather uh, around the outdoor fire pit uh, for a little bit of extra warmth during the cooler days and uh, it's just wonderful. I bump into all kinds of people down there. Uh, it really has become a wonderful gathering place in the park. And later this year, EFCL will be putting a collection of items reflecting their history into a time capsule in Community League Plaza. And I know I for one am excited to see what gets included in that. And this morning, we're joined by two members of the EFCL's executive team, Laura Cunningham Shepley and Ryan Barber. Laura and Ryan, what you do for our city is essential to keeping our community healthy, safe, and welcoming for everyone. And I'm gonna ask Ryan to share a few words with us on the significance of this anniversary. Well, good morning and uh, thank you, Your Worship, for the wonderful introduction. And I'd also like to thank our counselors and folks who are watching this, uh, this feed uh, this morning. You know, Community leagues stand as a place where Edmontonians of all backgrounds can come together and engage in sport and recreational activities that contribute to all our enjoyment. Uh, you know, in fact, it's, it's incredible that 75 of our leagues open rinks this winter, you know, truly amazing during this really difficult time. Leagues are also a place to discuss issues that matter to their community, to their city, and lately to our country. Uh, they do it all within the spirit of neighborliness, mindfulness, and understanding. 
you know, that doesn't mean that every conversation is an easy one, but rather that the FCL, our, our membership, our communities and our community leagues dare to have that conversation at all. Um, that really shows why we're still vital today, uh, just as much as we were 100 years ago. So 100 years ago, the FCL started as a federation of nine community leagues. And as of today, our membership is uh, grown to 162 with representation in every corner of our city. And uh, we continue to grow. So we, we arrived at this point in time thanks to the hard work of uh, hundreds of thousands of Edmontonians over the last 100 years who've given their time to serve their neighbours. And in many cases, in successive generations. Uh, we're also here because of the dedication of EFCL staff and the support we've enjoyed from the city and many of the councillors uh, who understand how we contribute to the social fabric of uh, our great city. So today during this pandemic, we are stewards of hope for our neighbours. Uh, but tomorrow we will be, as we've always been, community builders. And we will endure for many more generations as long as good people across our great city stand and make a difference where they live, building a future for our Edmontonians, our children and grandchildren and beyond. So thank you so much for recognizing our 100th anniversary and uh, our service to community. We'll keep working. Thanks so much. Well, thanks, uh, Ryan. Excellent words. representative of, of a partnership we truly value here at City Hall. So thank you uh, to you and through you to uh, your, your uh, volunteer colleagues and to Laura and the team at, uh, at the office as well who provide a lot of backbone and support to leagues to help them doing what they're doing, get great leverage for the city for, for our partnership investments. Thank you to, to each of you. From offering resources and support to providing positive outlets for our kids, Edmonton just wouldn't be the city it is without your efforts. So once again, uh, please join me in thanking everyone at EFCL, uh, including those thousands of volunteers for everything that people have done over the years to get us to this centennial milestone. Happy birthday. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, let us now select items for debate. Councillor McKean. That was fast. Um, yeah, I will take um, six, five. And uh, on behalf of Councillor Nickel, if he doesn't mind, I'll take six, six. They're uh, to be dealt with together, but uh, six, five, six, six. Got it. Uh, Councillor Banga. Thank you. I will take uh, six for, for a couple of quick uh, questions and then uh, nine one. Six four and nine one for Councillor Banga. And uh, nine. Oh, hold on. Too many papers. Uh, nine four and nine five must be selected. Okay. Actually, nine two must be selected. It it must indeed. Okay, we'll grab that one too, and we added nine uh, nine six, which also must be selected. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that. Consider it done, please. Thank you. Um. Councillor Nickel. 6-1 and 6-2. I think we need those ones. And 7-5 uh, seven, and 7-6 seven, for voting purposes, please. Okay, 6-1 and 6-2. And then 7-5 and 7-6 for voting purposes. Did anyone want them for anything other than voting purposes? not hearing any, then uh, we'll just separate those out when we get to the bylaws. Councillor Hamilton? Uh, my items were already selected, thank you. Okay, Councillor Henderson? Uh, 611. And would you be so kind as to take 612, which is the bill for Oh, right, sorry, I didn't write that down. 612 as well, for sure. That's a must be, okay. Got it. I think that's... Yeah. 
everything we need. All right. You want to move, want to move the balance or Councilor Knack? Uh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was a little late to the clicking on there. Uh, I need to select um, 713 and 14 just for voting purposes only, please. Okay, we'll sever those for voting. And there are some abstentions. So we'll need to split up 7 7 um, through 7, seven 12, 12 for voting purposes as well. Uh, to manage some abstentions, and then 713 and 714, both for abstentions and for voting purposes. So I think you've got that, Councillor Katarina, but we'll walk through it when we get to it. Um, were there, uh, did it, just, just to double check, no one has selected 72? The salutes bylaw changes. Just uh, it's it's a time specific, and it if no one selects it, that's actually helpful from an agenda management point of view. But I just wanted to double check that. So I haven't heard anyone select it. Okay, um, Councillor Knack, do you want to move the balance? Certainly, I'll move the balance. Second. Seconded by Councillor Henderson. All right. Please vote on those items not selected for debate this morning. Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. Uh, do you want to read back? Love to. Thank you. Council has approved the following request to reschedule reports. Item 5.1, Community Safety and Wellbeing Bylaw Review is now coming back to Community and Public Services Committee on March 24th, along with Item 5.2, Transit Fair Fines, is also coming back on March 24th. Item 5.3, Community Safety and Wellbeing Task Force Recommendations is coming back to Council on April 6th, as is the Item 5.4, Deputy and Acting Mayor Terms, the revised order. Item 5.5, .5, update on the bus network redesign, is coming to Executive Committee on April 12th. Item 5.6, Ampleside Integrated Site, is coming to Executive Committee on May 27th, as is Item 5.7, updated funding strategy for the 170th Street Bridge. Council has also approved the following reports. Item 6.3, Intermunicipal Planning Framework with the City of St. Albert. Over the page on 6.7, Indigenous Culture and Wellness Centre. 6.8, approval of expropriations, Yellowhead Trail freeway conversion. 6.9, compensation policy for elected officials. 6.10, changes to the 2021 council calendar. That's a change to audit committee. Council has also approved the following private reports. Item 9.3, the Women's Advocacy Voice Edmonton Committee, the appointment recommendations. Thank you. A good bit of work for Monday morning. Uh, we have no requests to speak or time specific requests at this point, so we'll handle things in order. Uh, let's start with the bylaws, uh, and I think we can do. Do you want the recommendation on 7 4 before the bylaws, or does it make a difference? One moment, please. Let me just triple check here. If it doesn't hurt, why don't we do that one first? Or it needs to be after. After? Oh, okay. So then, Councillor okay. Katarina, let's start with seven one through seven four. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll start with those uh, as an omnibus. So um, first, yep. first reading of uh, seven one to seven four. So second. Thank you. Uh, seconded by Councillor Nickel. Please vote on first reading. We have all the vote. Display the vote. Carried. Um, Move second reading, Mr. Mayor of 7174. Second. Second reading, please vote.
We're good to go. Display the vote, please. Carried. Mr. Mayor, I'll move uh, consideration for uh, third reading 7174. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote to allow third reading to proceed. Good to go. Display the vote. Carried. So, Mayor, I'll move uh, third reading of uh, 19641, 19018, 19624, and 19206, and the recommendation uh, after that on 74. Second. Can we just vote on the bylaw, first of all, Mr. Mayor? Please? Yeah, just third yep. reading of the omnibus, and then we'll take the recommendation subsequent. Please vote. We're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And Mr. Mayor, I'll move the recommendation on 7-4. Second. Please vote. to go. Display the vote. Carried. So Mr. Mayor, do you want to go to 7-7 seven, seven to 7-12 seven, for third reading? No, we can do, I think we'll just do them in batches here. 7-5 seven, and 7-6 seven, were only selected for voting purposes. So vote for voting. Yep. yep. Okay, so I'll move uh, first reading of 7-5, uh, 7-6. Seven, seven, can I request a separation, please? Yes, okay. of course, we'll do them one at a time then. So, first reading of 7 5. Okay. Second. Please vote. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried 11 to 2. I'll move second reading of uh, 7 5, Mr. Mayor. Seconder. Second. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Okay, please vote on second reading. We're good to go, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move consideration for third reading on 7-5. Second. Please vote to allow third reading to proceed. You're good to go. Display the vote, please. Carried. And I'll move third reading of 19517. Second. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote. Carried 11 to 2. All right, 7 6 is next. First reading, I'll move first reading of uh, 7 6. Second. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried 12 to 1. I'll move second reading of 7-6. Uh, second. Please vote on second reading. All the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move consideration for third reading on 7 6. Second. To allow third reading to proceed, please vote. You're 
good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And I'll move third reading of 19518. Second. Third and final reading. Please vote. Good to go, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Okay. 12 to 1. Okay, Mr. Mayor, so 7-7 uh, to 7-12, third reading uh, only. So yep. I'll move that uh, 19267. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, before we do, can we please have the two councillors that need to abstain to leave the meeting, please? Do they need to leave or can they just use the abstain button? They shouldn't be part of the meeting. Oh, can't be part of the meeting. Okay, we're leaving. Okay. Do they need to drop off the call or... Okay, all right. All right, um, then the 11 of us who are allowed to be here, <laughs> please vote. Or uh, you, you did move those, Councillor Katerina? Yeah, I'll, well, I'll uh, move third reading of uh, 19267, 19269, 19270, 19271, 19272, and 19273. Second. Okay, the clerks are insistent. Um, for the sake of form, Councillor Walters, will you turn your camera off for a moment? <laughs> okay, <laughs> please vote. You have all the votes. Display the vote. Carried. And Mr. Mayor, for 11, voting no, again, 11 uh, nothing, uh, just to be clear. One, uh, we'll do these individually, 713, 714, or yes. Councillor Knack together? Uh, no, I think, I think Councillor Knack uh, selected them for voting purposes, and then Councillor Walters must uh, abstain from these. So uh, you can move them both, I think, and unless there's a request to sever them. But I think Councillor Knack looks like he's okay with. Um, combining them. Okay, uh, so I'll move third reading of uh, 19219 and 19220. Second. Thank you, uh, Councillor Nickel. All right, please vote on the Summerlee bylaws. Yes. Thank you, Councilor Zadek. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried 11 to 1 with one noted abstention uh, of Councilor Walters, uh, who uh, you may now rejoin us. This is a test because if you can hear us, then you were there the whole time. So, <laughs> welcome back. We're at yeah, full thanks. I, I fail the occasional test. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I'm the one. I'm the one Mr. who failed the test. Yes, uh, Councillor. Point McKinney. of order. Yeah. Uh, just because I might have an upcoming issue myself, do we not have to state why people are are uh, abstaining? Uh, there are two different reasons why. If in the case of uh, pecuniary interest, yes. In the in these cases, uh, the the reason for the required abstention is because members of council were not present for the public hearing on a statutory um, land use matter, and so um, that that is the reason to be clear why uh, Councillor Banga abstained on several of these, and why Councillor Walters abstained on several of these. It was not a matter of pecuniary interest, but just they were not uh, able to attend the public hearings where these matters initially came forward. That's helpful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, go back to the front of your agenda and uh, counselor inquiries. I don't think there were any. I think there are all notices coming up that we're aware of. All right. Now, uh, 
these are not, are these cross-referenced or not cross-referenced? Yes? 6-1 and 6-2? My agenda doesn't say, so. You have one, one like presentation for two? Okay. All right. So six, if there's no objection, 6-1 and 6-2 will be cross-referenced. Okay. Um, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Your Worship and Counselor. Uh, good morning. As you know all too well, we have lived through unprecedented times in 2020, and last January we could not have predicted what we were going to have to face this past year. And day by day, we did not know what turn the pandemic would take. But despite navigating through completely uncharted territory for the better part of the year, I'm pleased to report that the city's operating budget came within 1.4% of the target. It's important to note that the City of Edmonton took a different approach to our 2020 budget than many other Canadian municipalities who opted to budget for a deficit. Instead, we acted early and made changes to our budget in April and continue to update Council on the evolving situation throughout the year. We believe that this was the most transparent approach to make clear choices so that Edmontonians could understand exactly how their tax dollars were being managed. Without those changes, we could have ended the year with a de deficit of more than 100 million. The City of Edmonton has a duty to measure and report our progress against the City's budget to Edmontonians and City Council. The operating and capital financial updates are just one way to meet this obligation, and this reporting is one aspect of how, of how we manage the corporation for the community. Our corporate promise of working together aligned with City Council to enable better life for all Edmontonians is of particular importance now as we continue a period of fiscal constraint. The capital and operating updates show how much the city spent compared to our current budget as well as projections to year end, which is different of course from the 2021 operating and capital budget. As you may recall, when city administration first presented three potential COVID-19 scenarios to council last March, the longest was six months in duration, which would have taken us to mid-September. A full year later, we are still dealing with the challenges of operating in a pandemic. This includes recreation centers that are still not fully operational. Transit ridership is approximately 45% of historic levels, even though we're operating a full schedule. And large portions of our workforce and the workforces of many other organizations are still working from home. The uncertainty and constantly changing environment presented an enormous challenge to our finance team and the organization. I'd like to recognize our staff's hard work and skillful analysis that has enabled us to manage through uncharted waters. Mary Pearson, CFO and Deputy City Manager for Financial and Corporate Services, and Stacey Padbury, Branch Manager of Financial Services, will be taking you through the capital and operating financial updates for the year. And I'll now pass over to Stacey, who will start with the capital results. Thank you. Good morning. The capital financial report before you today provides the results for the first two years of the city's 2019 to 2022 capital budget. The report also provides an update on the results of significant capital projects, as well as an update on debt and certain economic indicators that pertain to capital. Of the total $9.9 .9 billion approved in the 2019 to 2022 capital budget, $7.4 billion is approved for capital expenditures in the 2019 to 2022 period, and the remaining $2.5 billion is for the period after 2022. As of December 31st, 2020, halfway through the budget cycle, the city has expended 2.6 billion, reflecting 35.3% of the 7.4 billion planned expenditures for the 2019 to 2020 period. For comparison, at the halfway point of the previous four year cycle, the city had expended 1.9 billion, reflecting 31.1% of the planned expenditures in the previous four year cycle. The December 2020 report includes 69 capital profiles that are considered significant compared to 77 reported in September 2020. These 69 capital profiles cover 84% of the dollar value towards the total approved active capital budget. The green and yellow sections on these charts represent projects that are reporting within acceptable tolerances. The majority of significant projects are on time and on budget. 99.7% of projects are reporting within an acceptable tolerance for budget. 
99.5% of projects are reporting within an acceptable tolerance for schedule. There are 11 significant projects of the 69 that are considered red status for schedule, about 4.5% of the dollar value being reported on. The number of projects in red has decreased compared to the previous quarter. We've reported to Council regularly about the projects in yellow and red, but as a reminder, green status reflects profiles that are on, budget, that are on or under budget and on time. Yellow status reflects profiles with up to a 30% variance from the approved budget and schedule for develop stage profiles and up to 20% variance for deliver stage. Red status reflects profiles with greater than 30% variance from the approved budget and schedule for develop stage profiles and up to 20% variance for deliver stage and legacy profiles. Project reporting as yellow Project reporting as yellow show a variance of up to 20 to 30% from budget and schedules. The majority of the yellow status for schedule relates to the Valley Line Southeast. The projects in the red zone have more than 30% variance. While there are 11 projects on this list, one project makes up about 27% of the reporting of red, and that's the Northwest Police Campus. Further details are in the report. The city is subject to limits both externally by the Municipal Government Act and internally by the Debt Management Fiscal Policy. The Municipal Government Act debt limit is two times consolidated revenue for total debt and 35% of consolidated revenues for debt servicing. For the purposes of this calculation, revenue excludes capital government transfers and contributed tangible assets and excludes the revenue from EPCOR. The city is currently below both the Municipal Government Act limits. We are projecting to use a maximum of 63% of the total debt limit by 2023 and 34% of the debt servicing limit based on the currently approved debt projects. The city's debt limits set through the debt management fiscal policy, which are shown on the slide, are more conservative than the Municipal Government Act and hold the city debt servicing limit at 22% of revenues compared to 35% for the Municipal Government Act. The city is projecting to use a maximum of 52% of its debt servicing limit. The debt management fiscal policy also requires the city to maintain tax supported debt servicing within 15% of tax supported revenues. As revenues increase, the city can borrow more, but the tax supported debt servicing limit is the city's most constrained limit. The city is projecting to utilize up to 72% of this limit by 2025 based on the currently approved debt projects and projections. Debt limits have not been adjusted for the future effects of COVID on revenue. Administration continues to monitor this. I'll now move to operating financial results. The operating report reflects the December 31st, 2020 operating results compared to the approved budgets for tax supported operations, enterprise and utility operations, and community revitalization levy programs, and also provides an update on specific reserves. I'll cover waste services, land enterprise, Blatchford, before discussing tax supported operations and the recommendations in this report. Lastly, we'll review the reserve balances and provide a quick overview of third-party reviews of financial information. Waste services ended the year with a favorable variance of $11.2 million, mainly due to lower contractor costs for the delayed demolition of the Edmonton composting facility, lower amortization, as well as personal sa personnel savings due to vacancies and lower overtime primarily within the regulated side of the waste business. These are partially offset by lower revenues and a non-cash expense for the write down of the equipment used at the Edmonton composting facility. Land Enterprise has a net $3.9 million favorable variance as a result of lower than expected sales volumes due to market conditions which was offset by a mix of sales with higher profit margins than anticipated. Blatchford Redevelopment has a $400,000 variance due to lower than expected sales due to market conditions. And the Blatchford Renewable Energy has a $900,000 variance due to lower than anticipated spending on facility maintenance, 
operating contracts, and customer billing as a result of slower development of a slower development pace and delayed home builder construction activities. This is partially offset by higher than anticipated utility costs for the first full year of operation. At this point, I'll pass it to Ms. Pearson to provide an overview of the financial environment the last year. I know that Council is keenly aware of the timelines and effects of COVID on Edmonton. Over the past year, we have had many financial discussions and updates at emergency advisory committees. As we look back on our actions in 2020, it's important to remember what we faced in those moments. So I'll provide a quick history of how the pandemic influenced corporate budget decisions. On January 30th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency. And within six weeks, on March 11th, they declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. On March 17th, the province declared a state of public health emergency. In efforts to protect the health and well-being of city employees and the general public, the city declared a local state of emergency and implemented a series of measures, including the closure of recreation facilities, the cancellation of public events, the temporary suspension of parking fees and transit fares, and the deferral of utility payments and property tax penalties. In the early days, it was difficult to predict the overall effect of the city's on the city's financial situation. In April 2020, one month after the public health emergency, administration brought forward recommendations with the spring supplemental operating adjustment to specifically address the impacts of COVID-19. At that time, we acknowledged the uncertainty in the situation and the difficulty in predicting the duration of the pandemic and its financial effects. As all orders of government were focused on responding to the immediate public health concerns, we did not know at the time what financial support, if any, would be provided to municipalities. To mitigate the financial risk and uncertainty, administration proposed budget adjustments that were approved with the spring SOBA. Edmonton was one of the first municipalities in Canada to forecast the impacts of the pandemic and to publicly adjust the budget. The strategies to address COVID-19 in the 2020 budget in order of preference were expense management and use of external financial support, redirection of capital funding to operating, the Financial Stabilization Reserve and other reserves, and then repurposing the Corporate Financial Strategies budget. In July, the Federal Safe Restart Program was announced and included $2 billion in national support for municipalities. In early fall, the province was still working with the federal government to finalize the Safe Restart Agreement and the Municipal Operating Support Transfer, the program that would provide the funding to the city. Edmonton was allocated a total of $158.2 million in funding under this program. The funding was received in November. On November 16th, administration provided the quarter three financial update without the knowledge that the province would shortly declare a provincial state of public health emergency that resulted in the closure of most city facilities on December 13th. Although budgets were adjusted only once early in the pandemic, the city was required to adjust service levels multiple times throughout the year to address the changing health orders. And with that background, I will turn to this year's tax supported results. So early in 2020, it was clear that business as usual, the business as usual approach was not appropriate. So in April, we adjusted our tax supported operating budget by $143 million to reflect the reduced revenue and increased expenses. That's about comparable to an 8% tax increase. You may recall that as part of the $143 million, Council approved a reduction in operating transfers to capital of $46.5 million, essentially risk managing the capital portfolio. The remainder was an expense reduction. This financial prudence was necessary to adjust the very, to the very volatile conditions in which we found ourselves as a result of COVID. Tax supported operations ended the year with a $40.2 million favourable variance. This is 1.4% of the operating budget of $3 billion. Had we, not, had we done nothing, the city would have ended the year with a negative variance of over $100 million. In that event, we would have been in a very difficult situation now of having to address both a recovery plan and a deficit at the same time. Ms. Padbury will walk you through the composition of the $40 million variance shortly, but I do want to assure Council it was not the result of savings on personnel costs. In fact, personnel costs were extremely close to the budget, within 0.2%. Ms. Padbury will provide more detail on our recommendations for allocating the variance. It's important to note that we are not recommending transferring these funds back to the capital budget. But to briefly introduce what we are proposing, we are recommending carrying forward a portion of the surplus as it pertains to services 
and programs that were delayed through COVID, or to the pandemic support programs. We recommend 7.6 million be set aside to address the write-off of a loan between the city's tax-supported operations and weight services. And finally, we recommend the remaining funds, 24.8 million, be appropriated within the FSR to address recovery. We considered using this money to replenish the reduction made to capital transfers, but given that so much of the surplus can be attributed to the effects of COVID-19, the continued uncertainty of the pandemic, and the significant financial risks that remain for 2021 and 2022, we are recommending this one-time money be set aside for COVID recovery. We know that to stabilize our finances, we must continue to take a principled approach. You have seen these principles consistently from administration when trying to address the financial effects of the COVID pandemic. They were endorsed by Council last year to guide financial decisions related to the pandemic. We believe these principles show that that continue, we believe these principles continue to be applicable from prioritizing safety to honoring relationships. If the recommendations in this report are accepted, the total unallocated balance in the appropriated FSR will increase to 28.7. That's the 24.8 we're recommending, and there's 3.9 million currently unallocated. As we said, we'd like to continue to apply the original financial principles as they remain relevant. We'd also intend to overlay the economic recovery principles presented by the city manager at the beginning of this month. The funds would be used uh, in the principles of safe, it would be safe and equitable, evidence-based, strategically informed, methodical and balanced, condition-based and adaptable, partnered, partnered, honoring relationships. Those are the principles for our economic recovery. Council administration have identified a number of continuing pressures that require financial support in 2021, including potential further support for vulnerable populations, assistance with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, including the provision of facilities and support services for a large-scale vaccination, and ensuring we can provide a safe means to deliver a democratic election in the fall. And we also have business and economic support programs to fund economic recovery efforts. So the city's recovery advisory group will assess administration's requests on the basis of the underlying principles and ensure that decisions are evidence-based and strategically informed. Expenditure recommendations by uh, the recovery advisory group in administration will be brought forward for approval to the executive team leadership and the city manager, and then will be brought forward to council. Efforts will be made to consider all items holistically in order to prioritize elements for council consideration, but it's still a pandemic, so that is rather difficult to try and predict when, when we need to bring things forward. Um, with its recommendations, administration will move forward with the assumption that funds may be required into 2022. Transit ridership and recreational patterns need to be assessed, and support from other orders of government may be limited. So updates from, for spending will be incorporated into regular financial reporting to allow for as much agility and flexibility in the use of the funds by council while ensuring the corporation's fiscal sustainability. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy again to go through the details. This slide identifies the most significant variances contributing to the year-end tax-supported surplus position. Additional details of other accumulated year-end projected variances are included in the report. The corporate financial strategy budget was established to provide flexibility for emerging items such as contingencies for utility, for utility and fuel costs. The overall costs for fuel and utilities did not increase and with the combined impact of lower prices with lower consumption during the pandemic, the closure of facilities, and reduced vehicle usage, the actual costs were lower than anticipated. Recreation facility, re recreation facility operations are $6.5 million favorable compared to budget. A number of recreation centers were closed throughout the pandemic and health orders in the latter part of the year resulted in the closure of the facilities throughout December. And as a result, the cost to operate was less than originally budgeted. Gas franchise fees are $6.1 million greater than budget. The budget for gas franchise fees was adjusted downward as the pandemic was expected to result in lower commercial gas volumes, but actual figures have been consistent with the original budget. 
Facility maintenance costs are lower than budget due to lower contracted services, timing of the opening of new facilities, and lower material costs due to less internal breakdown work. A significant portion of this variance is attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic. Business license, business license revenue is less impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic than initially projected. This combined with an increased uptake in online permitting for new business licenses and increased home business licensing resulted in a favorable variance. A favorable budget variance is due to lower than budgeted grant expense for phase one and phase two economic recovery grant programs. Phase two is planned to occur in 2021. The timing was signaled in the fall. The unfavorable transit fare revenue budget variance is due to significant reductions in transit fare revenue and UPass revenue in the last quarter of the year as a result of continued lower ridership during the pandemic that was not accounted for in the spring supplemental budget adjustment. Attachment two to the report provides information on operating carry forward requests. Recommendation one in the report is for the carry forward of 2020 budget for expenditures committed but not incurred in the year, such as the temporary pandemic, temporary housing pandemic shelter and the bus network redesign project with matching 2020 funding already appropriated in the financial stabilization reserve as identified in table one of schedule A. These requests total 10.5 million. Recommendation three in the report is for the carry forward of 2020 budget for expenditures committed but not incurred during the year, requesting new funding from the financial stabilization reserve as identified in table one of schedule E. These requests total 7.8 million and relate to support programs such as the economic recovery grant and the zoning bylaw projects, as well as projects that were impacted or delayed by the pandemic. The most significant carry forward is for the economic recovery grant with an urban form and corporate strategic development of 4.2 million. Recommendation two is related to rescheduling of grant and rebate expenses for the revolving industrial servicing fund program. The expense budget of 9.9 .9 million and matching funding from the reserve is being requested to carry forward into the, into the 2021 budget. Recommendation four requests $7.6 million of funding be appropriated within the financial stabilization reserve to cover the potential write-off of an outstanding non-regulated notional loan between tax levy operations and the waste services utility that needs to be repaid by 2025. A report on the non-regulated loan repayment plan was presented at the December 4th, 2020 utility committee meeting and outlined repayment options for this loan. Discussion at this meeting indicated a preference to address the loan outside of the regulated utility. Recommendation five is to request city council's consideration to appropriate funding of 24.8 million within the financial stabilization reserve to be used to cover the potential impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The next two slides highlight the projected year end balances for specific reserves. The planning and development reserve. This year end, the projected balance for planning and development reserve is 16.6 .6 million, which is below the minimum target. Council approved an exception to meeting the minimum balance until December 31st, 2022. The year end balance of the traffic safety and automated enforcement reserve for 2020 is 20.3 million, which is above the minimum required balance of 2.3 million. A detailed reserve schedule for the period of 2020 to 2022 is included in the report. The balance of the reserve will decline over time as the capital projects are completed. The previous provincial budget included a reduction in the city's share of automated enforcement revenues. The 2020 to 2022 budgets have been updated to reflect the reduced revenues and the impact to the expense budgets. Administration will bring forward a plan for the 2021 to 2025 period that addresses potential further reduced revenue impacts. For the financial stabilization reserve, 
On the basis of the recommendations, no amount of the current year surplus remains unallocated within the financial stabilization reserve. The projected balance of the financial stabilization reserve is 133.9 million. This balance includes the preliminary tax levy surplus of $40.2 million and any year end carry forward and other recommendations to be funded from the reserve. After these recommendations, the balance of the reserve will not change as the remaining surplus would be appropriated to cover the potential impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The financial stabilization reserve is an uncommitted reserve account established for the purpose of providing funding to address significant emerging financial issues. By policy, the reserve must have a minimum balance of 5% of general government expenses with a target balance of 8.3. The balance of the reserve is projected to be above the minimum balance of 110.4, but below the target of 183.2 million. With that, I'll turn it back to Mr. Corbold to conclude the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would like to share with Council uh, some information related to third-party review of the city financial information. The uh, city received the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for its most recent multi-year budget. This is the 20th consecutive year we have received this award. The city received the Canadian Award for Financial Reporting for 26 consecutive years. The preparation of the annual financial report to citizens has been uh, for a number of years, and the most recent was the sixth year we received this award. These awards are based on comprehensive criteria and awarded after a review of financial peers. We always seek improvement, so administration is to enhance our website and determine what, can do, what we can do to address their concerns without compromising our integrity uh, and our standing with our peers as evidenced by the awards noted above. I want to thank those in financial reporting in the city who strive to make what is a very complex financial system uh, involving reserves, regulatory components, and a large capital program easy to understand. They have demonstrated a willingness to listen and lead in transparent reporting, and we will continue efforts to ensure transparently, transparent and timely information is provided to Edmontonians. This concludes our presentation, and we would be happy to take questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation and the work behind it. Um, and there's only three of you, but I have some sense of the massive effort <laughs> that these reports require, uh, and that's a lot to synthesize. So to those who are listening as well who do this work, thank you. Uh, it's been a really, really tough year for everyone, including financially. <laughs> so um, this was selected by Councillor Nickel, so I'll go to him first. So just, Councillor Nickel, we saw that you've left the meeting. Are you still with us? We're just trying to make sure you're not having connectivity issues. I believe his, he's having some technology issues, but he will be re-logging in in just a moment, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, Councillor Henderson, then. Um, yeah, a whole bunch of questions. I'll try and get into one if I can. Um, in, in reality, um, $7.8 million is just a carry forward. It's not money we've saved. It's money we haven't spent yet. So... You know, it's a, it, is, it is extra money for this year, but in actual fact, we still need to spend that money, correct? So, so the, the surplus, strictly speaking, is around 32, not 40. Fair enough? That, that's a fair. Yeah, okay. I just, I just think, you know, so that we're clear, the, the rest of it I understand. But um, um, uh, I'm curious about a couple of little pieces. Um, there's there's reference in both the capital and the operating to the street lights and contract work and operating in the LED, LED street lighting and capital and I'm really curious to know what that's about. Um, I you know I know it, it, it struck I think I've been hearing anecdotally that we've been struggling a little bit with Epcor getting our street lighting dealt with in a timely manner, um, but we also changed that contract and I so I just it just flagged for me and I just was curious to know a bit more about that. And I, maybe two different issues, the capital issue and the operating issue may be different ones. They just seemed similar. Councillor Henderson, uh, it's scored separate. Yep. They, uh, you could have highlighted that they are two separate issues. They are uh, um, connected in a way that they are both tied to the street lighting system, but the capital work is uh, part of the bigger project, which is uh, a large scale conversion of about 45,000 uh, street lights. That's the capital project that uh, 
Yeah, partly I, with partly some of the delays were due to some of the implications from COVID, um, uh, but we are striving to get that back on track in terms of the capital replacement. Some of the other issues that you alerted alluded to with respect to um, uh, EPCOR and, and third party contractors, we are working through those to try and uh, expedite some of the outages that were uh, were outstanding, but that work is underway. Well, and part of the variance looked like it was the contracts had come in more, had been more expensive than we anticipated. So I just was curious to know what that was about. So part of it, uh, there are some variances of, in, in terms of what was estimated and what the actual contracts came in at. Uh, we still, uh, in terms of the actual overall replacement of the 45,000, we are confident that we'll be able to get that back uh, within the project. Okay, thanks. I just... I was just interested in finding a bit more about that. The other thing that I wasn't sure I understood um, was that the reference to, to um, a grant in lieu of taxes and the unfavorable taxation revenues due to assessment corrections, but I wasn't sure what the link was between grant in lieu and assessment. I didn't think it was that specific. Um, so, and given the history we've had with the, I'm guessing we're talking grant in lieu, we're talking provincial and federal government. So, um, I, I just wasn't sure I understood what was happening there. We just need to look that up, Councillor. Sure, for you. it's on page. Uh, it's attachment one of um, uh, attachment one of the operating on page nineteen of thirty-seven. I'll ask another question while you guys yep. are looking it up. Um, why are we just again curiosity? Why we're we're not putting all of the, the surplus into the reserve unappropriated. We can always pull it back out again later. Why we're making that choice, I mean, it seems to me it's semantics to some extent, but I just was puzzled by that. It is a bit of semantics, Councillor, but the, the intent is we did note that a lot of this was due to COVID. I mean, the shutdowns yeah. of the rec facilities yeah. and others, and so to honour the intent that we've been following over the last year is to... To allocate it for that, it is yeah. Purely so up to in council. a way, it's it's under the same theory that, that you know it, in my first question about carry forward, we're saying there's a kind of carry forward here that we need to recognize. Correct. Is that okay? Fair enough. Um, it's probably not a bad rigor to do. Um, I would also add, Councillor, that that is the most likely scenario where we'll need these what funds we'll need from to a recovery it. perspective. Yeah. So I think it makes sense to sort of earmark it for that, knowing yeah. so that we don't have other ideas, quite frankly, that come up that gotcha. aren't related to Fair enough. It. It's a Good protection, yeah, and um, and, and I would, you know, reading the report on the the, ex, the third party externals, you know, it strikes me with the CD Health thing. What's a little bit annoying about that is, you know, that it just seems like they're, and I don't know what their agendas are. I suspect their agendas are different, um, but I, I worry a little bit with, that we let the tail wag the dog in trying to respond to it, because uh, it feels to me like we're making the right choices for the right reasons, and I and it worries me that we begin to think about adjusting to deal with somebody who may have different reasons for, so I just thought I'd ask that question. I agree with you, Councillor, um, but it, there always is an intent if somebody looks at it, if they, they don't find it clear, we wanna take away what we can. Fair and enough. so we're just culling what we think is of value. Some elements they had, for example, picking up the fact that we adjusted our COVID budget in April, um, which is after the year, the year started, where we would not have, change that and the way they want us to account for EPCOR is unacceptable and so there's things we are not going to do uh, but if we if they take if we take the point about clarifying our website and others we'll always we'll always take that absolutely feedback. yeah I just I just would hate to think that we were going to adjust to somebody else's standards if we don't agree with them um, I'm out of time thanks if you could if you figure out that grant and Lou in the future I'll either come back around or... I can answer it oh now. great thanks um, so the budget was adjusted for an 11 million and at the end of the day we came in closer to 13 million that the province didn't pay um, and I think it's just a, in terms of us estimating the budget and then the timing um, of actually getting the list of what we get in terms of grants in lieu of taxes. Okay, I'm going to come, I want to ask some more about that then I'll come back around again for a second round on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKean. Uh, I saw Councillor Nickel on the list. I oh, is he to... back? Councillor Nickel, are you there? Yeah, I just went through one of those infamous, it's time to update your computer, hanging me jiggies. I think that's happened to a few of us, so I apologize for yeah. dropping off. We've all been there. So uh, you so, selected this, so go ahead. 
So thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the FSR uh, here is 133.9 million uh, to date, correct? That's correct. So is that uh, before or after the 40 million? So it's technically after we put the $40 million in, and then if you pass the recommendations, the same $40 million comes out and gets appropriated. Okay, so yeah, I just wanted for clarity, that's how I read it as well, so it's a, it's, it's a $40 million exit. So, I, and, and Councillor Henderson actually touched on a, a question that I was also interested in, is, is that we, you know, with the FSR, FSR policy, even though it may sound like a bit of semantics, uh, with regards to, but we don't earmark the FSR for, for funds of any kind, do we? No, that the FSR is truly unallocated money. Right, right. So, so why would we, uh, you know, on the page here, uh, can you explain to me then the 7.8 million that's required for this uh, loan uh, for waste services, uh, the utility, uh, because now you're suggesting if we have to put this money aside, that uh, to me says this loan is at high risk. Why wouldn't we just take the money, uh, leave it in the FSR for now, till the problem uh, arose? So what this does is it, it just holds it in the appropriated FSR so that we have it there should we need it. So... There is, a, there is a FSR, and then there is an appropriated FSR. That's correct. One is unallocated and one is allocated. So our, our allocated FSR is not part of the calculations of our unappropriated FSR, correct? That's correct. So what is, our, what is that sum for the appropriated FSR? Um, I just need to grab that off the attachment. You see, and this is this is where it gets into a little bit of confusion for me. If it's guided by what part of the policy and how, if it's appropriated, then it's not really FSR, is it? Or am I missing that policy distinction? I, I, we have had internal discussions about whether we should rename the appropriated FSR, but you're correct. They, there is the, uh, the financial stabilization reserve that we typically yeah, report to is yeah. the unallocated one, and the appropriated one is the allocated money that we're holding for specifically identified items. Okay, because it, it, gets, it gets troublesome when I start to track some of this stuff. So... It's a, the unappropriate is 133 less 40, and then that 40 goes into your appropriated FSR? Yeah, so counselor, at the bottom of attachment to pay, or on page uh, four of eight of attachment two, shows right. the, the, the balances. So for unappropriated, the balance is 133.9 million. Then we add the surplus, remove the carry forwards of 7.8, remove the waste services loan, and remove the appropriated amounts for COVID. And you can see in that schedule that those are being removed from the unappropriated and placed into the appropriated. Then the balance, so the projected balance of the appropriated FSR is 248.6 million. 248.6 million, and we have a list of, uh, of commitments against that, ranging, give me, give me just for, for, for public consumption, uh, the range of things that are holding in the, 248 million are holding in the appropriated FSR. Um, well, so some of them are identified in, for carry forward at the top of that schedule. Um, and there's ongoing, so Schedule C has that information. Let me just grab Schedule C. It's on page six of eight. Yeah, page six of eight. 
Um, so there are things like transition payment received from EPCOR. So at the time we transferred the drainage utility, we're still holding a portion of the transition payment in there. Um, there's the money that we appropriated from the Edmonton Public Library when they gave back a portion of their surplus last year. Um, there's various things. We, can, we could get you a complete listing of everything that's allocated. Well, I, I would think it would be important in these times to find out exactly where what's in our FSR and what's in our FSR, but I'll come back for a second round. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Knack? Uh, I think uh, Councillor McKean was oh, next. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor McKean, you got bumped. Apologies. I got bumped to the bottom of the list. Uh, yeah, thank you. I want to start with the uh, community revitalization levies and this um, you put them through a stress test, and I wondered if you could plain language that for me and uh, tell me what level of confidence that should leave us with uh, for the three CRLs. Councillor McKean, Ms. McCabe here, a stress test means that we look at what the potential um, variables, these aren't, this is not plain language, let me start again. Uh, what we did is we looked at what could happen um, in the economic outlook and took a worst case scenario to it. And a stress test isn't even, it's like a worst, worst case scenario. And what that means is it gives council the confidence um, that even in uh, uh, poor economic times, uh, that we are still expecting the revenue uh, to be able to cover the costs associated with the CRL in order to uh, stimulate the development in the area. And there was a list of projects, some of them might not have come online yet, that could be um, set back if the, if, let's say the recovery coming out of the pandemic took longer than expected, um, we would be able to do that, yes? That's correct. In particular with the downtown CRL, the way that the capital has been mobilized is it's uh, being mobilized um, over a longer period of time. And so that does allow for council to adjust um, and for administration to bring recommendations to council to adjust as we go in that particular CL CRL. I do worry a little bit about Jasper Avenue in coming years, but uh, that may have to wait. I wanted to ask about this uh, CD Howe situation and potential reputational damage from that. Uh, it would be pretty easy for the financial media or the media to write a story saying CD Howe says Edmonton's budget is inferior or insufficient or, or not um, transparent enough. Your argument is in fact, there's some miscommunication or missteps in the way uh, we're, we're talking past each other or something. What do we do about that to ensure that Edmontonians are informed of at least the city's position on this, again, in plain language? Uh, and I see Ms. Owen, you're on. So has there been any thoughts to how do we respond to that? Yes, Councillor. We've been working closely with Ms. Pearson's team to ensure that we uh, convey messages to the media about our own financial performance and the accolades that we continue to, to win in order to mitigate the CD Howe um, reputational hit. Right. And I'll right. just add, Councillor, we've also spoken to some of our partners, um, for example, the Chamber of Commerce here in Edmonton, and explained our perspective, which they agree with, uh, and we sort of walk them through everything. So we're working with, that's just one example of many partners we're working with. Uh, and we've had a chat with C.D. Howe, and Ms. Pearson has had several chats with C.D. Howe, and I think they understand our perspective, and we look forward to, you know, next year perhaps being different. Well, that would be nice because <clears throat> I know how um, mainstream media stories could come out and it could be one press release from C.D. Howe and, and that gets jumped on, unfortunately. Um, I just want to double check a couple of other things. We The economic recovery grants, that pool of funds, is that tapped or do we still have remaining funds there? We still have remaining funds and we're recommending carrying forward 4.2 million of that. And the reason for that is to tie the phase two of the grant program to the economic uh, strategy that we're bringing forward, the action plan that we're bringing forward to uh, committee in April. 
and those will be larger grants. And so we wanted to make sure that we had a strong tie to uh, job creation associated with those phase two, uh, phase two grants. Good to hear. Last one, um, and this may have been in the report and I apologize if it was, but we had higher than anticipated business license revenues. What's the explanation for that, Ms. McKay? We did. So what um, happened was we adjusted the budget um, quite significantly, first in COVID, because we were expecting that we wouldn't have as many uh, businesses um, uh, in Edmonton. But what we did see was it was not as bad as we expected. So there were still definitely impacts to businesses for sure during COVID, but we did see new businesses open and we saw a lot of businesses still renew uh, in much higher levels than we were anticipating uh, at the beginning of, of COVID. A silver lining, maybe that's the wrong term, but a little bit of a glimmer of hope. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. Councillor Knack, now it is your turn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for the presentation today and a few questions. First, I just wanted to check in on the the debt projections. Uh, and I was trying to pull up some of the old numbers, but I didn't get a chance to do it in time. Uh, so looking through the attachment three, I think it was, uh, and it shows, I think it, as it goes out you know, 10 or 15 years, um, Showing 2024, 2025, that's where we're projecting uh, to be about 70, I think it's 71 to 72 percent of the total debt servicing limit under our debt management fiscal policy. And I'm just wondering, I, I, I feel like that's actually less than I remember that number being. And I don't know if that's because of a variety of different changes. Uh, we've obviously had to make some changes to our budget, because I feel like at one point it was potentially going to be as high as about 80 to 82 or 83 percent. Does that sound familiar? I'd have to go back and look, but it is something that we update on a quarterly basis. So as the cash, like as our cash flows for projects go further out, if they if they are delayed for any reason, or if the timing of the grants are such that we don't need to borrow, the money that we thought we needed to and it gets pushed back a little bit further. We're also repaying debt, so it's it's conceptually possible that it's lower, but I'd have to go back and check. Okay, that's it's not huge. I just thought that just, uh, I feel like it was different and that might be important as, we're, as we reflect on all of the changes that have happened. Uh, a few, I think the, the only other question I had just related to the report in 6.2 and, and, the, um, and the results that we're seeing of legacy versus the uh, project development and delivery model. Uh, I wanted to just get a better understanding. I mean, I think, I think I know it, but I wouldn't mind hearing just a maybe more detailed explanation of what you see is probably some of the biggest differences that's causing the PDDM model to provide these better results. I think there's still, you know, the challenge we run into is there's still this perception that every project that the city does is uh, over budget and behind schedule. Uh, the numbers continue to show that's not true. I think that message is starting to get out more and more, but I wanted to understand, uh, you know, if you can share what's different and, and what do you think has, has helped with that? And then more, and then I guess the follow-up is how do we make sure we continue to try to communicate that so that people realize that, that in fact, uh, the vast majority, whether by total number or even by project budget, are uh, on budget and ahead of sc or on schedule. Thanks, Councillor Knack. It's Adam Lachlan um, responding to that. I think the biggest benefit of the project develop and delivery model is that when you're setting the largest component of the budget allocation, which is related to the physical construction, um, under the legacy system, it was done at a very conceptual level where you didn't have enough details to accurately um, estimate both schedule and budget. As you progress a project uh, through the, the project develop and deliver model, you gain more certainty around the risks and the contingencies that are required for those risks. And so by the time we get to the point where we bring to council a project for um, construction budget approval and schedule approval, we've worked through a number of design um, deliverables to confirm um, the schedule and budget to a greater degree of accuracy. So it, it's really, to, to use an analogy, if you were gonna renovate your home, 
um, you do a, a ballpark estimate of a certain dollar amount, what we're doing here is we're actually doing some design work and some investigative work within the home before we set the budget. And so it gives us a greater accuracy of budget and schedule and the risks associated with the project. Great. And, and then maybe to Miss Owen, uh, just to expand a little bit, because I, I do see occasionally that there's, you know, we'll see, I'll get messages from people saying, like, you know, the the projected budget back on, you know, take the Valley Line West as a great example. I, I've seen people said, you know, that project was originally budgeted at one point seven billion dollars but that was 10 years ago before council even approved the budget in the first place so it's it's not in fact accurate to say that because the project was never approved but how do we from a communication perspective try to talk about that make sure that information is getting out there so that people understand especially under this new model that we're not approving the project schedule and budget until we finish that work so every one of the communications teams attached to specific projects within IIS are working uh, constantly to not only give project updates, but to give um, accountability updates. And so this whole issue of institutional credibility is being threaded into every piece of work that they do. We're also taking a very concerted effort to ensure that in addition to project-specific communications, there is department specific communications happening coming out of IIS that uh, underscores that projects are on time and on budget and on purpose, i.e. they're aligned with city plan. That's great. Thank you. I'm out of time. Appreciate it. Councillor Nack, if I can just add um, the one thing with your debt question, um, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that Lewis Farms Rec Centers is no longer in the, the debt projections, and as that was a, an exclusively debt-funded project, that would have also made a difference in the percentage. Yes, I'm very sad about that. Thank you. Councillor Essinger. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with the, the PDM model for Mr. Laughlin. Um, does it cost us more as a city to use the project delivery model versus traditional uh, way we did things? Uh, there's a, I would say in a whole, no. Uh, what I would say is there's more upfront costs before you get to certainty on whether a project will advance or not. So you invest early and council may still make a decision whether the project would advance to construction on the basis of scope, schedule, and budget and risk of the project. But the costs are essentially the same. Uh, what, what's good about this is that you know those costs are predominantly upfront versus the tail end when we get into construction, if there is a, a difference. Thank you. And, and I'll go for the last time, I hope, to the Northwest Police Campus, now that it's substantially complete and they're moving in. Um, but it, it says in the report that it'll be removed from... Um, the future capital financial update, but any future budget issues would be brought forward to a, a budget meeting. So what are we thinking about future budget implications if it's complete? Uh, that project, particular project, does have some um, outstanding claims that we still need to work through, uh, and that, that will be um, a flag for council that should there be any settlements associated with that, um, there there would be a discussion at council related to those. Um, we're we're feeling confident about that, uh, but uh, but no and no additional costs anticipated. It's just more a placeholder that we may be coming back related to a settlement associated with the claims that have resulted from that project. Well, that's good to news because I quickly thought if something else had gone wrong and there was cost, but this is just proactive. I appreciate that. Um, my next question um, is uh, the budget is based on uh, what we had uh, approved, uh, for example, for the limited number of rec facilities that will be reopened once we're able to reopen. Um, are we considering uh, broadening how many rec centers can open under the, the COVID dollars that we have? Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Mr. Smith. Uh, 
Councilor uh, Eslinger, uh, yes, we are. Um, um, we're working internally on, on what that might look like. Um, um, the, the budget that is in place now, um, um, we'll, we'll see how far that can go in terms of um, um, opening all of our all of our rec centers. Um, um, I'm getting a bit of an echo there, I'm not sure. Not sure. So maybe I'll just jump in um, for for 2021 in the fall, we had uh, put some money aside for the opening of rec centers um, as part of our plan for the use of the municipal operating support transfer. So if you recall, we did that budget adjustment in the fall. Um, so, so there's some money set aside for rec center openings. Um, but it's probably not, it, it, it may not be enough depending on the duration of how long centers are going to be closed. So I take it that we may open more. It's going to be uh, a work in progress based on dollars. That's accurate. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is around the economic recovery grant that we have a proposed to carry forward unused funds for. Um, I'm surprised we have unused funds and do we identify any barriers to people accessing them in our program that we have to adjust now? Yeah, Councillor Essinger, uh, good question. And it was actually intended to always have a phase one and a phase two associated with the grant program. When we first rolled it out, uh, we rolled out micro grants. We worked with the business improvement areas and other businesses to get input. And uh, what we heard what, at, at that point was businesses really needed smaller grants to help with PPE and um, incremental costs associated with COVID. And the intention with phase two was to be larger grants that were, fa uh, that were tied to the economic um, action plan and that those larger grants will be focused on diversification of the economy as well as job creation. So we didn't uh, identify any barriers, uh, but we did uh, do the smaller grants first. Okay, thank you very much. I'm out of time, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Oh, you're on the second round. Anybody else on the first round? Uh, uh, I'm gonna, who should I pass the chair to? Among these two gentlemen here. Councillor Henderson, okay. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, just I, uh, excellent reports and thank you. Um, the, we, we looked at the question of the reserves a few years ago, and I remember we talked about whether the appropriated FSR should be called something different because it's kind of the carry forward fund for appropriations. But I think the rationale at the time was that um, if things got really bad, we could unappropriate them and use them for uh, financial stabilization. I think that's why it's still called that, and that's the underlying premise. Notwithstanding that, I mean, as bad as things got in the last year, we never thought about that. Fair? That's fair. Or, or we considered that a last, last resort. Um, and then some of the things that, I mean, the piece of it that's the COVID-specific reserve really is stabilizing us through... Uh, the recovery phase of this. So it is a multi-year stabilization function that's appropriated as opposed to the sort of true emergency unappropriated piece. That's correct. Okay. Um, it is tricky to, to uh, explain to the public because it is a little jargony, but I, I, I think the questions are fair. Um, but I think the policy is sound and, unless we're going to review it. The other um, very micro question I had was, and, and maybe this is where Councillor Henderson is going, but I know that um, the streetlight retrofit program, and so my questions are about the capital side of it, the delay showing on that, there are sizable cost savings on the table um, that are being leveraged to pay for that and sizable GHG reductions on the table. And so I thought this was actually a case where um, what's in the red on this, leaving an, a significant energy efficiency upgrade is actually a piece of carbon budget deficit, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and so I wanted to 
ask in the spirit of realizing the savings that are the premise of it first and second, the GHG reductions, which are co-benefit, um, what we could do, if anything, uh, to, to get that one back on track. Your Worship, we are uh, working with uh, our vendors. Part of the challenge last year with COVID was also some supply issues with uh, respect to delivery of product. So we are working with uh, the number of vendors. We do have a number of different vendors that are doing uh, the work. So it's not all tied into one specific uh, uh, vendor. But we have some flexibility uh, and there is some option in terms of scalability with each of the vendors. But we are working with them to try and get this back on track. And does that project complete the retrofits uh, of the the whole city, or does it get us to a? Uh, I didn't look up the capital profile. Sort of what portion of the city's inventory it updates? Uh, Your Worship, that would get us to a little bit over eighty-five percent, I believe. Uh, it takes care of basically all of the standard lighting that's not in a back lane or not decorative. Okay, and then neighborhood renewal will take care of the rest of those over time? Uh, well, neighborhood renewal uh, does some of that, but the decorative piece is something we're still working through. This will bring us to about 90,000 uh, luminaires out of the, I think we have about 115,000 in total. So it brings us up to basically everything that's straightforward. The back lanes are, are more of the challenge because these are uh, facilities that are actually owned by EPCOR and not the city. And then one other question that arises from the the, the debt numbers is uh, with the federal announcement of permanent transit uh, funding and assuming there's provincial matching, and this is still a few years out because we're busy building what's in the budget now, but um, it might make sense to do some and I don't know, I guess the first question would be, has administration done some analysis of when, for example, uh, the debt associated with South LRT and some of the other projects that are in place starts to come off and create some rolling debt room, uh, which was part of the plan to be able to match against whatever else that we're doing in the future. And, and some of that's coming off at five or 6%, uh, and we're gonna be able to leverage it much, much better uh, uh, at maybe two or three points in the coming years to keep up with the federal aspiration around big transit. So have we got a sense of when those are coming off and when some of that would be available so it's not net new tax increase every year for the municipal matching portion? So we do, we do track that. Um, we track it specifically because the room created, um, we've set aside for LRT until 2025, um, but we continue to track that to see, and you're right, there is a differential between the interest rates that we, of the debt coming off and what we will incur in the future. Okay, well, that'll be a next capital budget kind of big picture question, but I'm out of time, so. Um I'll oh, I'll move a second oh, round. Okay. Uh, 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 second. second round. Do I have a seconder? Second. second. Councillor Carmel, uh, please vote. And display the vote. Uh, we'd like oh, to get all the sorry. votes. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Councillor Patel. I voted yes. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Walters. And we have all the votes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Display the vote. And that's passed. Chair, back to you. And on the second round, I go to you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up a little bit because I'm still, I just, you know, and I realize this, this isn't a huge amount, but it's been an irritant, this question of grant and lose, so I thought I'd chase it down a little bit. Because um, it says here that it's mainly due to assessment corrections. So was that them disagreeing with our assessments? That is correct. So not only did they cut it in half, they decided that our assessments on their property were not the right assessments? Councillor, we're trying to just get our tax people online to answer your questions. We might have some but I, We don't allow too many other of our people to decide what their own assessments are. That's why I'm chasing this one down a little bit. So um, what's been conveyed to me is that um, the GOA had a few more grants in place of taxes that they refused to pay after we passed the tax bylaw. 
So I'd need to, I'd need to get someone else to answer a little bit more detail. If they're not online, I mean, I you know, it's not a huge amount. It's just you know, this has been an ongoing irritant. So I this is this feels like a couple kind of double whammy. Not only they're only paying half of what they should be, but they're now deciding what they pay on and what they don't. Yeah, and I, I guess like at a high level, it's an adjustment between what we plan to get and what we actually got. So, so some of it may be that, and some of it is we're making an estimate at a point in time too. Right, so, so they, this may be in us adjusting our assessments rather than them deciding. That's correct. Okay, fair enough, which is, that's a whole different question, I, I, okay. But, I mean, yeah, all right. And it, it, remind me, because Grant and Lou, do we get Grant and Lou from the federal government as well? Because the same principle should apply, and we've never spoken about that piece of the puzzle. I, and I thought it did, because my memory is this has been a national issue, which is... We do. We do, okay. So this, this could be, I, this may not be, this may be the federal government, it may not be the province. Correct, and we highlight it may be our estimation. Gotcha. Their budgets are at different okay, points. Okay, fair enough. I just wanted to chase it down a bit so that I could understand. Great, thank you. Councillor Nichol. Thank you very much. So let's go to page 118 of 699 or page four of eight. Um, did I hear you correctly, uh, Mr. Mayor, that the unappropriate or the appropriate FSR, uh, and I thank you for that clarity, but I just want to hear it uh, correctly, that the intention of that appropriated FSR was flexible, uh, if all things go badly. Is that kind of the interpretation of it? Uh, last resort. It yeah, could be, a last it could resort be reclaimed plan. to cover other contingencies or emergent costs. Oh, no. Okay. It that could be reprioritized. Thank you very much. Because I was getting very confused, and this is to, to administration, because we have on table one, we have a definition. The following months were appropriated within the FSR. And then we have on Schedule C, funds remaining available for applicable expenses in future periods. How does, you know, it, it, I guess it's this definition of appropriated and unappropriated FSR that's, that's giving me a, a bit of concern. Because if, if I read it correctly, right, the FSR unappropriated sits at 133 million. And then I'm kind of getting, putting the math together that the appropriated could range anywhere from 208 million, if not more. So again, could, can somebody straighten me out uh, because I'm not, I'm not following the charts here um, in terms of, for example, on Schedule C, is this an exhaustive list of what is in the ongoing reserve appropriations? So um, prior to the recommendations, the appropriated financial stabilization reserve is comprised, it's 208.4 million, and it is comprised of the items in Schedule A, which are the things that we're recommending for carry forward. So they were already appropriated within the FSR and we just need to carry forward to another year. The items in Schedule B, which were right. previously appropriated, ongoing appropriations, which is Schedule C, and I should point out that the largest chunk of that is the municipal operating support transfer funding that was essentially placed into the appropriated FSR to allow you to use that this year. And Schedule and that D. that came from? The, um, it was the safe restart funding that flowed through the province. Okay, right. so with, that's 158 with million from the province, right? Yeah. Thrown into the kitty. Yes, that's correct. It's, it's okay. matching. Please go continue on, Ms. Padbert. And then Schedule D. Um, which is ongoing, ongoing reserve appropriations related to capital. When you add those four things up, you get $208 million. Once you pass the recommendations in the report, it will then be increased to 248.6. Oh, so that's where the other 40 comes from. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was missing 40 million. Okay, I, I really do appreciate that clarification for me. I missed that 40 million there. So that's where we're at the 248. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So I guess I'll just use my last minute with uh, some questions on 
something that's always kind of been in the back of my mind with these capital profiles. Um, let's take the ana, the bio digester uh, product, uh, the anaerobic. It's way over schedule. When was that uh, project initially uh, started? What what was the date? It was it was 2011, wasn't it? Do you recall? Uh, Councillor Nickel, um, I'm checking on it. It's it's one of what we describe as a legacy project. Yeah, um, no, Adam, my question is when did it start? And I'm just confirming the start date on it. Uh, physical construction, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you shortly here. Okay, because th that, do we as, a, as an issue of, of, of managing our infrastructure, do we adjust the profiles in terms of their on time, on scope, on budget? Do they get a restart every time we, we adjust the budget or we um, adjust the scope? Uh, based on uh, the last time we came to council with um, sort of a, an assessment of how we measure our projects on time, on budget, on scope, if council directs a scope change, uh, if there is a budget adjustment associated with um, unknowns, um, there is a, a consideration of adjustment. But if not, then, then it would continue to be measured against the original budget. The challenge we have is we still have a number of like I said, legacy projects that don't go through the project development delivery model. And this is one of them. I'll have to have one more third round here. I'm sorry. But. Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you. So, um, and I don't know who the question should be directed towards, but anyway, you guys can decide. Um, so recommendations one to five, um, they're all shuffling the money around. And uh, so one to three are basically increasing the budget and uh, four and five are uh, in relation to the appropriation of uh, uh, FSR. Could somebody tell me what exactly uh, is the is the end result here so at the end of the day after passing all of the recommendations what ends up happening is the surplus goes into the FSR and it comes out in the exact same amount 7.8 for carry forwards stuff we should have spent this year but are spending next year 7.6 earmarked for the waste loan and 24.8 million dollars which will earmark for covid the remaining recommendations that was money that was already in the reserve and that will just be used and carry forward and expended in a different year than was originally planned okay and uh then my next question was about uh, our debt limit uh, just looking at uh, that graph there, um, you know, and the amounts, we are going all the way till 2039. So, in your mind, uh, I mean, there are uh, more projects to be approved in the next few years and whatnot. Uh, how is our ability to uh, approve the uh, projects in the future is is uh, limited by that uh, those uh, long-term debts so councillor because the 15 percent because the debt management fiscal policy has a limit of 15 percent of tax supported revenues for debt servicing in the long run, you're limited towards that. And so, so what we're doing is we're tracking that to see how, how much, so each time we bring forward the capital expenditure, we will show you how much you could approve in terms of tax supported debt in the cycle. For a number of years now, we've been cautioning you that you're getting close to that limit. Um, and so making sure that approvals, we always try to make sure 
that when we recommend stuff for approval, that we're recommending some recommending in accordance with the policy and nothing that would take you over the policy and nothing that would ultimately make you so restricted that you couldn't react to things. Okay. And uh, Mr. Lawton, uh, could you be able to uh, explain to me how um, uh, PDDM model uh, increases the upfront cost but not the overall cost? Like, uh, I'm more interested in the upfront part. Uh, sorry if I wasn't clear. It it doesn't increase the upfront cost. What it does is actually allocates more upfront before you make a decision on when to invest in the larger component of the project, which is the construction. So essentially the previous budget process was uh, defining the capital budget requirements at a very conceptual level of the project. In this case, council is identifying through the capital governance policy and the project develop and deliver model PDDM to invest in that upfront design um, so that you're so that we're all more uh, informed on scope, schedule, and budget before you make the big decision to invest in the large construction component of the project. Um, depending on the project asset type, uh, it's five to ten percent of the total project costs, and could be as high as fifteen percent, depending on the complexity of the project. Okay, um, that's good. And one more question about. Uh, um, our city winning all these uh, consecutive uh, awards uh, for the last 20 years, 26 years, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, CD Howe uh, coming with uh, this, uh, I guess, uh, you know, in a way that uh, it's basically bursting our bubble there. How do we, how do we, uh, and uh, explain it to people, uh, folks here, uh, that, that uh, you, you know, we're okay, but uh, this is uh, what they said, CD House said, is not okay. And uh, I, I, I'm getting a little bit confused. Could somebody be able to put me at ease there? I'll happily tackle that one, Councillor. It's Katrin. Um, we have been as clear as we possibly can be with CD Howe that we don't agree with their methodology. However, we don't think it would be seemly to um, attack them uh, publicly. The way we have chosen to handle this reputationally is to be very clear with media and with Edmontonians directly through social media about the ways in which we construct and communicate our budgets to be as transparent and accountable as possible. So we're not taking CD Howe on, having had those individual conversations, we're not taking them on publicly, we're just addressing our accountability and transparency publicly. Thank you. Councillor Katerina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of clarifications for uh, for me. Uh, there's been some good questions on the vaccine delivery uh, uh, and the costs associated with it in that uh, that's being factored in uh, by us and what it's going to cost us. So uh, has that actually been a discussion with the uh, province or the feds that uh, uh, the costs involved in the vaccine delivery uh, is not in kind, but that it would actually be a cost to the municipality that they would not cover, or that monies would be recovered from the uh, COVID fund uh, per se, the monies that we're getting uh, for that. How, how was that uh, uh, calculated uh, on the cost to us? Yeah, that continues to be an ongoing discussion with... Uh the, the provincial government councillor so we and we you know we still haven't narrowed in exactly uh, if the if the site will be open and and what time so it continues to be an ongoing discussion with them and we haven't got a final number on that so this is very much anticipatory okay uh, and just uh, you know this might have absolutely nothing to do with it but on one hand 
were, I guess, negotiating uh, recovery uh, or cost or, and helping them, obviously, uh, uh, with uh, in-kind and facilities and possible staffing. And yet, at the same breath, we're asking questions about uh, grants and loot. Uh, th th those two just dealing with the province, uh, take it for now, or even with the feds that... Uh, uh, we're losing on one end, but yet uh, we're required or we're, we're offering uh, to provide uh, other services or funding uh, from our, our municipality uh, for them uh, to help them, uh, and ha which helps us all. Uh, so are those discussions completely separate or do we actually go in there and say, well, we're giving you this, but you're taking this uh, and on and on, um, Mr. Corbo? Yeah, Councillor, I, I would say at, the, at you know at the right time in the right place. Yes, those points are made. We don't tie everything to a quid pro quo, if you will. Especially on the vac vaccine vaccine rollout, I've I've been very much focused on public safety first, and you know the principles that we've taken to council. But yes, there's always a reminder of the appropriate time and with the the right person in terms of what we're doing to support. Um, and so, I, I would say. You know, we're always discussing that, and it, but not maybe in every conversation, but certainly as part of the greater conversation. Well, it just it, you know, I mean, we're discussing it here today because obviously the uh, financial update and uh, sort of everything uh, dovetails uh, into each other. We've got to make uh, decisions on this. So I, I would, you know, if that's the process, I, I would say that probably this is a good time to remind them that we're. Uh, here to help and uh, offering them something uh, we'd certainly like to be offered something back uh, maybe and quid pro quo might not be the right term for it that I would you know uh, go in discussions with but uh, I think that that should be taken into consideration and maybe this is a public meeting uh, somebody will uh, actually hear it so the other clarification I needed or not clarification just the information that uh, Mr. Siebert if you're still there on uh, on transit uh, operations, so uh, obviously you're down 14 uh, million uh, this time around. Uh, do you have a number for uh, 2020 on what the uh, ROI was uh, on uh, on uh, transit on operations? Uh, usually we run about 40 percent, uh, 40 you know 44 in a good year, 30 something in a bad year. Uh, where are we uh, as far as 2020 is concerned uh, once you take into account the 14 million uh, down? So, Councilman, you're uh, pretty much bang on with 40 percent ish. We did make a couple adjustments last year. We did lower uh, the actual budget uh, for a period of time uh, due to the lower uh, amount of revenue. And then for the uh, last portion of the year, it was, it was, uh, at the projected level that was based on the initial assumptions. So I'm just going to ask Ms. Houghton McDonald to provide uh, a bit more detail in terms of what the actual ROI was on the adjusted revenues and expenditure. Thanks, Lord, um, and thanks, Councillor, for the question. So uh, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but do know that without the, tran the transit envelope uh, that came from the funding, which was intended to offset the revenue losses, uh, we're probably looking at about 22% thereabouts on that uh, revenue cost recovery. And then if we add that funding in, it actually brings us back to normal, uh, what we would expect, which is, like you said, just hovering around the 40% mark. Oh, okay. So uh, with that, that hasn't changed, uh, Mr. Seabrook, for many, 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 many years, uh, 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 the actual recovery in that. Uh, at some point, uh, or even now, is there a strategy where we can move that number up to something a little more uh, uh, realistic or, or uh, acceptable? Uh, uh, because other municipalities, obviously, and, and this is the question comes from always comparing uh, what we do to what uh, other jurisdictions do, Vancouver, Toronto, and that sort of thing. And uh, their recovery is uh, better but it's not uh, all recovered. I think Toronto's at 60% uh, recovery. So, I mean, there's a big gap there uh, when we do comparisons. Uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm way past my time. I, was, I wasn't watching the clock, uh, Mr. Mayor. No worries. Uh, I think there'll be a third round here. So, um, Councillor Paquette. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, just pick up on that a little bit. Um, just looking at that number, so it looks like based on revenue ridership is about 
about half of what it normally would have been in a regular year. So I'm just wondering, given the needs for distancing, would we want that number to be higher than it is? Do we, does it make sense that it would be about half of what it would normally be without a pandemic? Uh, Councillor, I'll, I'll take a bit of a stab at it and then I'll ask Ms. Hot and McDonald to put a little more detail into it. But based on the fluctuations we had last year from the evolution of COVID, from the understanding of around what social distancing was required, what wasn't, some of the variations from the information we were getting from uh, AHS, it was very dynamic last year. So to say this is what we would anticipate or what should have been, is very hard. We did try and use the foundation of uh, AHS guidelines as the uh, um, basis for what we were providing. And certainly in the uh, first period of the pandemic, when the lockdown was in a more, um, I guess, stricter phase, we did have very, very low riders of uh, level of ridership, but we were also reducing service levels correspond so it was it was quite a fluctuation over the course of the year and perhaps Ms. Hart McDonald a little bit more detail into that. Uh, thanks Gord. The only thing I would add is we learned a lot over the year and implemented a lot of enhancements uh, to protect safety. So in you know knowing that as we look to recovery we can definitely accommodate more people uh, coming back into the system and we're monitor monitoring bus loads uh, and those types of things and as Gord said the provincial guidelines are helpful in terms of how public transit is to be managed during this time. Okay, and barring any surprises, we can pretty much anticipate ridership is going to be increasing over the next six months. That's our goal. So we are monitoring on a weekly basis and we have modeling uh, considering, you know, I think it's a list of 10 different factors uh, impacting it, but we're, we're feeling optimistic and I'm looking forward uh, to seeing people return. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. And, uh, no, nope, that'll do it. Thanks. We'll move a third round. Second. Please vote on a third round. Councillor Katarina. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, we vote. I did. Display the vote. Carried. Councillor Nickel, go ahead. Thank you for the third round, everyone. Um, so, Mr. Laughlin, I'll, I just need to understand this. Let's use the digester as, a, as an example. For, uh, okay, I understand it's a legacy project. When was it a, its original start date? Uh, thanks, Councillor Nickel. The project was approved by Council in fall of 2013, and it had an identified completion date of 2015. Um, we'll just... Yeah, okay. That, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not worried about that. And w has there been a material change in budget over that time period from between then and now? Um, I would ask our finance folks if they could help with that. I. I don't know if there were specific budget changes. What I will say is that uh, when the project was transitioned to IIS, um, we discovered that the design still needed work. And so the design extended until 2017. Uh, it wasn't ready for construction start until that date. And it was um, what we call hot commissioned, which is essentially, uh, while it's still under construction, moving it over to commissioning in 2020. And we've been working through some legacy um, uh, issues. For, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To get it resolved. Yeah, I was talking to Mr. Lebrec about some of those legacy issues. So, yeah, I do believe we did put some money into it. There was a there was a bylaw uh, a number of years ago, but maybe finance. If do you have that number quick, if not, I can get it later. We'll uh, we'll endeavor to get that to you in terms of specifics, Councillor Nickel. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it just goes to the question, Mr. Laughlin, about, you know, I think and maybe I'm paraphrasing Council Cardmel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I think you originally asked those questions about the goalposts 
of uh, capital projects, what gets a restart and when gets it a restart over its original budget. Can you explain me that process and how often that occurs? So as part of, um, again, the project develop and deliver model, we have a what we call a checkpoint three. And checkpoint three is where we advance the design far enough along where we've got greater understanding of scope, schedule, and budget. And that's when we would typically bring a project to council for approval for that larger budget approval for construction. Um, leading up to that, if there's variations of scope and schedule or budget, it's conversations that we would have with council around any adjustments that need to be made. Yeah, when so, the budget, when so, that budget and schedule is approved at checkpoint three, that's what we're held to. So the goalposts don't change unless um, there's a decision by council to change the scope of the project after checkpoint three. Okay, but th- that does happen. Right. We start out with an original budget, original concept. We can take a rec center here or a building there or whatever project is. And then we can move to checkpoint three. There is an adjustment and then the clock starts again. That's correct. And that's the separation between what we call our planning and design, which is getting a project scope, schedule and budget to a greater certainty. And then there's the delivery component. Planning and design is pre checkpoint three. Delivery is post checkpoint three. Sure. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Padbury, uh, I go to attachment three, page six to seven, looking at total debt servicing. Uh, Do you have that page in front of you? I do. Okay. Am I reading this correctly that as in 20, uh, uh, the year 2021, we'll have 314 million in debt servicing costs? Uh, yes, under the debt serve the debt the 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 council policy. Sorry, that is correct. Three hundred and fourteen million dollars in total debt servicing under the DMFP. Okay, and so if, so if I add those up for the next one, two, three, four years, uh, we can anticipate our debt servicing costs. Uh, I'm adding up to one point four billion. Yes, if you added the number four years of that, that would be approximately correct. Okay, super. And I do understand. I'm I'm clear that that it's it is a little complicated because we get money from other orders of government and so on for LRT and things like that. But these are these are the macro numbers as we understand them. Yes, that's correct. And so my my calculations from twenty five to thirty is there will be another two point. Three billion in debt servicing costs. If we add that that column up, is that a fair uh, fair statement to say? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, I was just going to move uh, the recommendations in uh, three point in six point one, and that we receive six point two for information. But I see Councillor. Um, I'll make the motion anyway. And Councillor Knight may still. Second. Okay, seconded by Councillor Walters. All right, uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you for putting the motion on floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and just really quickly, I, I did want to follow up because um, I remember the um, the moving the goalpost conversation that Councillor Nichol was raising. Because we first raised it um, back when we introduced the reporting model in 2015. Uh, I remember there was one of the first reports, there was a recommendation to change. And in fact, Council said, uh, so we still allowed the scope to change but we didn't allow you to change it to then be considered on time or on on schedule. So if I recall correctly, and and maybe it might help to have the numbers, I I can only seemingly recall probably five projects or fewer that we've actually changed the scope on and allowed you to then have that reflected in the reporting. Do we have that number? It's it's at least, it's it's probably no more than five, maybe as high as 10, but... uh, I can only recall three that council's ever voted for. I don't have that in front of me, Councillor Knack. I can uh, do some digging here to see if I can find the number of projects that have been adjusted. And what you're talking about is from a scope perspective. Uh, yeah, I, because I think I think that is important because I, I I'm I remember when we first raised this in my in my first term, uh, it, we we wanted to make sure that people didn't feel like 
council was trying to fudge the numbers or or make it make it seem like we're better than than we actually were. And so the numbers that we have are based off very, very few adjustments. So I think having that just might provide that clarity for, for all, including myself, so that we can be, be clear on that. Yeah, we can follow up post-meeting uh, with great. that. That's great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Carmel, if you could take the chair. Oh, yeah, because Councillor Henderson's got the motion. So uh, just just speaking to it briefly, appreciate the the reports. Um, uh, I I took note of the commentary about the progress we've made on PDDM as well, and I think uh, a little more elaboration on that. And mindful of Councillor Nack's questions, I think there's some important proof points there about the progress we've made uh, that um, would be useful to share with constituents. Um, so, uh, so I think that's a very good flag. Thank you for those questions, Councillor Knack, and thank you, Mr. Lachlan, for uh, committing to follow up with some information on that. Uh, uh, that'd be useful for my office as well, because we still get those questions too. But I think we've made some good progress there. Um, and, and on the operating side, uh, I think obviously it's been a very, very challenging year but the city of Edmonton acted very swiftly and made very difficult decisions. Um, and, and I was in a bit of tension actually because not all the other large Canadian cities were acting as swiftly and I was advocating on their behalf for what seemed like slow decisions compared to what we were doing. Now we all needed the aid that we got uh, and we're gonna need some more help potentially with transit for maybe a couple of years as ridership recovers there. Um, so we don't lose ground. So, so there was definitely real need and there remains some real challenges for us in 21 here. But uh, I think we were really well advised uh, by Ms. Pearson uh, and uh, Mr. Lachlan and, and ELT at the time uh, to make some, some very difficult decisions. I know these decisions were very disruptive for our workforce and, and will have some lasting impacts. But I, I do think the, the city was out front uh, among our peers, uh, taking this the, the fiscal dimensions of this uh, challenge very, very seriously and acting to adjust our budgets downward um, in ways that uh, allowed us to be whole at the end of the year. And 40 million sounds like a lot to the average citizen, but it's $40 a head across the million of us. And to come in that tight in a year as disruptive of, of this, which is essentially 1%, uh, give or take on the whole budget uh, when you account for some of the timing issues is pretty remarkable given the the broadside that we took um, over the last year multiple broadsides really uh, financially speaking so I just uh, really want to express my gratitude to uh, administration for how they've uh, helped to steer us through this and then thank council for their forbearance and perseverance uh, at the decision-making times, which have not been easy. But it really has been a good team effort, and uh, the bulk of that $40 million, uh, is going to be rolled back into recovery efforts to support uh, uh, our business community's rebound and vulnerable people, which is, I think, the right place to put that small surplus for this year. Normally, we would put it in... Um, in the general rainy day fund, uh, but we're putting it specifically in the COVID blizzard fund uh, to support uh, continued recovery efforts. Um, and we're gonna have some heavy lifting to do uh, after uh, Tipino Wow closes um, and, uh, and our business community is, is, uh, is enduring a lot still. Um, so, so I think we'll put those funds to good use. We won't just uh, kind of put them in the mattress and forget about them. Um, but that's it, we're only in the enviable position of, of having uh, some resources to work with for recovery because of that very, very tight fiscal management. So well done. I'll take the chair back. Sure, we're sure. right at lunch here, but I see we've got more speakers. Um, I'll need a motion to extend. So moved. Thank Second. You. Uh, just to complete this item, uh, moved by Councillor Knack, seconded by Councillor Walters. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. We're just getting the yes, vote. Clerk. We're just getting the vote sent out to you. Thank you, Councillor Caterina. We'll note your vote.
We're good to go. Display the vote, please. That's carried unanimously. Councilor Nichol. Oh, I just, uh, for voting purposes, I'd like to separate the two items, please. Uh, six one and six two. Yes, sir. Okay, we can do that. Um, anyone else wishing to speak? No, then, um, did you want to close or? No, okay, all right. So please vote on uh, the recommended appropriations in 6.1, the operating financial update report. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Councillor Katarina? Yes, Madam okay. Clerk. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote. Carried 12 to 1. And then on the um, receipt of information of 6 2, the capital financial update, please vote. Yes. Yes, Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried. Okay, let's pause there and we'll come back on item 6.4 um, at 1.30. Till then, we're in recess. Thank you.
will again be recording the session. Good afternoon and welcome back. Let's roll call in a moment here. All righty. Um, Councilor Carmel. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Councillor Katarina. Hello. Thank you. Councillor Zadik. Good afternoon. Hello. Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Thanks. Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Henderson. He will be back. Yes. Uh, he will join us as quickly as he can. Uh, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Thank you. Councillor McKean. Present. Thank you. Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Perquet. Good afternoon. Hello, Councillor Walters. Happy to be here with all of you. Thank you, likewise, and Councillor Banga. Good to be back. Right on. Okay. Um, we were on sale of lands for um, Permanent Supportive Housing to Homeward Trust Holding Company, uh, which came up as a recommendation from Executive Committee. Uh, we heard uh, some representations from uh, concerned neighbors uh, and were able to address some of those questions, perhaps not all of them, uh, but um, it was a robust discussion at committee. And I would go to Vice Chair McKean for, uh, to put the recommendation on the floor, if you don't mind. That's what I'm on for, actually, Don. So yeah, I will put the recommendation on the floor. Fantastic, okay. Uh, I'll second that. Uh, so that's before us now. Um, and uh, Councillor Banga, you had selected this one. Or sorry, was there, was there a presentation? Uh, no, we're, we're straight into discussion on this one. No, I just got a couple questions. There. Go ahead. Um, so for, uh, I understand that uh, we are uh, offering land for sale to Homeward Trust. Um, basically, those five portions for five dollars, I guess. Can I know what is city's real uh, contribution to this project is, or are we just getting the money from the provincial government and uh, passing it on to on to uh, the Homeward Trust? Uh, just uh, changing hands, I guess. Uh, Councillor Bang, I think we have Crystal Kajenner on the line. She can talk to you about the uh, the financing of the of those capital projects. Sounds good. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Um, so, uh, Councillor Banga, there are some uh, ineligible. Well, there's a, there's two components that make up the city's contribution. So, one is the, the value of the land. So, whether that's the book value or the market value that we're foregoing by um, giving it to Homer Trust at a uh, at a nominal amount instead of selling it for market value. And then the second component is there are some in, uh, ineligible costs that um, cannot be covered by grants um, from the other orders of government. And so, those would also represent a city contribution and I don't have that exact breakdown in front of me but I can get that for you if you'd like yeah if you could please and uh, my next question is uh, uh, basically uh, once this is uh, all built up with the city's contribution provincial con contribution and everybody else 
or else is uh, then operating are we going to be continually uh, paying into the operations of these uh, and, and this indeed five places uh, uh, Councilor, I'll start off, and then part of our delegation is Susan McGee, Executive Director of Homer Trust. Uh, Councilor, there's no no additional funding from the city for the operations of of uh, of these new uh, these new these new projects at all, at all. There may be some reallocation in terms of their current funding that they currently get that would go that would go to these projects. But maybe I'll ask uh, Ms. McGee to weigh in on that as well. Oh, I, did we lose? Did we lose her? She was there a minute ago. Crystal, maybe you can you can jump in in terms of any additional information. Sure. So, uh, Councilor Banger, we estimate that five point eight six million dollars a month or a year, rather, in a annual ongoing operating costs will be associated with providing supportive housing through these uh, two hundred ten units of supportive housing. Um, and at this point, we continue to um, advocate to the provincial government, working with Homer Trust, our partner, to um, request additional operating funds to cover that cost. Um, however, if they are unable to get additional funding at this point, Homer Trust has indicated that they are able to reallocate, or potentially will be able to reallocate um, within their existing funding portfolio to support these built these units. So um, until the buildings open, we'll continue to seek new funding from the government of Alberta. But if that's not possible, Homer Trust will reallocate to fund the units on an operating basis for the uh, and ongoing. Thank you. I, I apologize. I, I lost connection right at the time that that question came up. I do apologize. And I, and I would add to um, Crystal's comments that in the plan to end homelessness, that reallocation to um, more acute care supports has been contemplated as part of our planning. So we are always looking annually at allocating to high priority needs. So it's been something that's been um, in our planning, in our planning for some time, but certainly consistently still supporting the ask of the additional support dollars from the government of Alberta. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll be quick because I know we discussed that committee, but I had some um, constituents in my ward reach out with concerns um, about the decision-making process or how the site was decided upon. So um, this is for administration. Um, in this application or in this, as part of this, we're approving um, the sale of lands, not just in Westmount, but there's also a site in Inglewood. And there was some concern about the proximity of those lands um, to one another. Uh, could you... Um, speak to that proximity issue and if you foresee it having any potential impact on the um, on either your ability as Homeward Trust to operate those facilities or um, maybe some detail on that. I mean, I'll have a few comments just to start off here. Certainly the zoning is appropriate for, for, for these uses and, and as we sort of discuss this work um, we zone to the use, not to the not to the people that are going to be using the facilities. Um, and the other piece is that we've been working in these neighborhoods to develop what we we call the good neighbor plan, and work and we're working with Homer Trust. And there's been some initial work on it in that realm, and that will continue. So it's a matter of really engaging with community, connecting with community on on how these how these new uh, residences can, can operate with community, so that you do you know, maybe not eliminate, but certainly reduce any kind of impact and have them be, be part of the community. Uh, Susan, Crystal, do you want to weigh in? Sure. I, I think one of the questions that came up in our discussion with community was the clarification that these sites don't interact from a staffing perspective or a service perspective. So there's no movement of individuals either to or from both of the sites or actually going to any of the sites in order to get services. So the interaction um, between the sites was one of the things that community asked for clarification on, and I and I think we've tried to provide that in that they are independently supported. Ms. Kajender, did you want to add anything? 
Sure. The only other thing I'll add, Councillor Hamilton, is that um, we do have a set of criteria that affordable housing and homelessness works with real estate on to, when we're identifying sites for acquisition for supportive housing. And one of those criteria is um, location criteria related to city policy C601, which was approved by council and, and identifies a neighborhood target for affordable housing. And so that ratio is a consideration that we look at um, in when, we, when we're buying um, potential supportive housing sites. And so in this case, uh, both the identification of both sites was in line with that policy approved by council. All right. That, that clears up a lot of things and a really good reminder, Mr. Smythe on the, because uh, this, this isn't a zoning, this is the city dis, dispossessing itself of, of land for a time. Correct. Absolutely correct. So we're the, maybe some of the conflict perceived conflict here is that this is not going through the ordinary land use um, process because this is not a land use change. Uh, that's absolutely correct again, yes. All right, thank you. Um, and, you know, to allay some of the concerns that we heard at committee, um, uh, Ms. McGee, um, there were some concerns voiced about the uh, uh, success of, of the supported um, living model and could you speak to your experience with um, the model and its ability to help people succeed? Certainly with these units they are part of what has been a very integrated and coordinated approach in Edmonton in terms of prioritizing individuals certainly for housing first and foremost but also the right level of supports so the sites and the support provided would be um, appropriate for everybody that is referred to them and we've had um, projects numerous projects with a range of supports and I think that range is important to, to under, underscore because um, all of these projects will be supported by different agencies those agencies are qualified and competently supporting people throughout Edmonton now and um, there's constantly monitoring to make sure that we're providing support to situations where if anybody does move, they're supported in actually moving to another location as well. Great, thank you, um, and that's my time. Thank you, Councillor Nichol. Yeah, Ms. McGee, can you describe to me the kind of the typical resident that's going to be in this these units? Well, individuals that are referred to supportive housing would be um, folks that have, through the assessment, uh, we have the coordinated access assessment, would benefit from higher level supports, um, be it connected to the mental health services that would be in reach to the sites. Um, often individuals who've had a long experience of homelessness have um, just concerns with in terms of maintaining their, their housing and having inter like support from individuals that would prevent in other circumstances an eviction. So in terms of the individuals themselves, um, you know, really there's so many journeys into homelessness and so many journeys out of homelessness. They are um, going to be individuals that have that need. Currently we're supporting about a thousand people in apartments throughout Edmonton. And uh, amongst the community members experiencing homelessness, those referred to these sites would be, would be, would be folks that have a, a higher level of care need, but they're, they're also independent units and they will be um, also renting their apartments, paying rent for their apartments and uh, managing their day-to-day -day, um, circumstances as we all do with that additional on-site support. Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason I ask that question is as soon as you can put a kind of a description and a face to it, it takes some of the anxiety away, I would argue, from, uh, from the unknown, right? Because mm -hmm. people can imagine all kinds of things and and so on. So I guess my other question goes to, in terms of the uh, uh, the 5.8 million and the properties that we are talking about here, how many people are we planning to serve uh, with this uh, endeavor in, this, in particular? If somebody can give me a number or kind of a, a measure on that. Uh, Crystal, do you have that number off the top of your head? Uh, well, across the five site, uh, sites, Councillor Nicole, we're looking at 210 units, and so that would mostly be um, for single single people, but there would be some couples and that sort of thing. I don't know if Susan or Ms. McGee, if you'd like to elaborate. <laughs> yes, they're all studios and one bedrooms, and we do we do have opportunities for couples. Um, the as in terms of like over the course of managing the projects, 
um, unit turnover does happen. So if you're comparing units to, to, to individuals, it's a little bit harder to assess, but it is, it is housing. And so, you know, we have individuals that have moved into projects like Baldwin who have been there from the beginning. And then we've got units that have turned over um, annually or folks move out. Because Ms. Mickey, they don't, don't misinterpret my question. I, okay. that, that yeah. I know from the operational model, that's fine. It's just how much money are we spending? How much money we are expecting to help Right? How many people are expected to help? That's all. That's all I'm curious mm -hmm. about in terms of uh, what we can, what we're managing. You know, in terms of the population, I, I'm, I trust you. People know what you're doing, so I just wanted to get that number. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Katarina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so, uh, to uh, Ms. McGee or or to uh, Ms. Uh, Jenner, uh, the uh, Good neighbor uh, planner agreement. Uh, just uh, run me through when that takes place. Uh, when's that established, uh, the good neighbor agreement? So we will be contracting agencies um, in the process. Typically, we would contract a couple of months prior to opening, but in this case, we will contract sooner, so in the summer. And it's really important that the agency providing support on site is party to that agreement. So those agreements will become... Um, shared and worked through with community as soon as we've confirmed those agencies. And that's expected to be like a, a July, August decision. Okay. Uh, with the good neighbor, I mean, this has come up uh, many times now. We have uh, some in place, some are in progress uh, to be put in place. Is there a template uh, that's followed uh, for good neighbor agreement? So that way uh, it's known ahead of time, or does the community have to wait until you decide on who's going to actually be running the facility who the agency is, and then you uh, start to develop a good neighbor agreement with uh, with the community. Oh, for sure. In all of the engagement on all of the sites, there's um, the city has uh, with the web portal that they've had to their engagement. We've shared the the basic structure and the components of a good neighbor agreement and its templates. The specifics of the agreement will include specific contact information, um, who the individuals are, and the escalation process in terms of uh, uh, direct phone numbers. And, you know, just like a lot more site specific information, but it is there. Okay, and so at uh, at that stage, there, if, if issues do come up, is it Homer Trust? that takes the lead on addressing it, or you refer them to the agency that's actually operating the facility to uh, uh, get involved with, uh, with issues that uh, arise? It's both, but most importantly, we do want the agencies on site to be developing really strong relationships with community and resolving in, in, um, issues if they do arise directly. And the issue there, though, is certainly we want to have the escalation opportunity if the community isn't satisfied with the resolution of that issue. And the, the Good Neighbor Agreement also identifies that process and um, expediency around it. Okay, so the ones that are already in place and operating, uh, what, what's been your experience? Uh, I know what my experience has been uh, in following through on the Good Neighbor Agreement. What's your experience been? Uh, We've had a variety of circumstances that have um, raised issues. Issues have been raised around one, a site, for instance. Um, it's explored. Um, very often we find out that the concern that was expressed was actually associated with another property or not a resident of the building, but it's you know proximity to something else. And we fully explore those to find out um, what exactly the circumstance was. And then the, in some circumstances, it's been a matter of the team on site meeting with and having a meeting with community to clarify and to resolve an issue. And have you uh, had to go through uh, sort of uh, to mitigate the issues and involve others, uh, including peace officers, uh, EPS and, and others uh, to, uh, um, to resolve uh, some of the issues that have happened with even with good neighbor agreements uh, in place? Uh, and uh, I can, if, you, if you'd like, I can, I can give you an example, but uh, I'll, I'll, maybe I won't at this point. Yeah, I mean, there, there is follow-up. One of the things that often is cited is that um, uh, a police officer in the area has been contacted around something. Um, it's been attributed to a site. Um, our staff has reached out to connect with those police officers, really clarify what exactly the specifics were 
and um, kind of really finding the, the, the facts versus the, the perception. And then um, there's been meetings again with the agencies and specific individuals to clarify that. That's, that, that would be a step is that we would reach out to those individuals. Okay, and just so I understand for clarification here, uh, this funding is uh, uh, coming from uh, not us, but uh, others. Mr. Smythe, is that correct? Uh, I'm reading the report here and that uh, well, $17 million dollars coming from... That, that, uh, that's correct. There's no, there's no tax levy municipal dollars in the capital side of this. Right, okay. So that's all coming out of uh, uh, that particular uh, fund... Uh, uh, there. Uh, what, the what's your time frame, uh, Ms. McGee, on uh, on the five sites? Have you got a chronological order of uh, uh, which sites first, second, third, fourth, fifth? Um, they they are all under development in some really aggressive timelines. So we expect to have them open um, end of this year, um, January occupancy. Uh, for all for all the locations. That's okay, correct. so they're all going uh, consecutively uh, or with, uh, with each other. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone wishing to speak to it? Councillor uh, McKean to close. Well, was, yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Um, I just, I, I didn't get a chance to do this last week. Um, Devin and Kelly Pope, the owners and operators of the Mercer Building, Mercer Tavern, uh, who are really great um, community builders, um, are opening uh, a small, albeit small, supportive housing facility in the Stovall Block, which they bought, I don't know, a couple of years ago, uh, in partnership with Boyle. Uh, street Community Services for 30 women who've been living on the street. So I wanted to thank them and, and their leadership. Uh, but it's the kind of leadership that we've seen offered by others in our business community. And I'm hoping we can tap into that in the future because as some of my colleagues have pointed out, there's a lot of money, public money going into this and we might be able to take advantage of some philanthropy and efficiency from our private sector partners in the coming years. I want to thank again administration for all their work on this. Susan McGee, I know you, you and your folks have been running flat out for a lot of months and um, you deserve a, and your staff deserve a nice holiday somewhere. So, and, and I think I could probably say the same thing for the housing and homelessness folk at the city of Edmonton. Um, as I was thinking about this today, I wanted to remind my colleagues, I was asked to attend a um, public engagement session for one of the sites way up on 137th Avenue, uh, hosted by uh, our public engagement team and uh, Councillor Bev Esslinger, and I really watched her closely that night, and the amount of grace and courage under fire that uh, Councillor Esslinger showed me uh, that night was very, um, well, inspiring. And uh, I just thought it's, uh, we need more of that in the world, a lot more of that in the world. So Bev, uh, thank you. Um, and I, um, I, I don't wanna forget, we, we heard from several people at Westmont last week who brought forward their concerns. And I in no way wanna ever tell anyone that, that their concerns are not warranted or we don't want to help them with that. But my, my experience with supportive housing in the ward and the ward I represent has been really positive. They are not problem spots at all. And that there will be, these will be well-run, well-functioning um, facilities and the people going in there will be vetted to make sure that the facilities and are a success and the people going into them are a success. Um, this has been a real high priority for this council. We're, we are going to open five supportive housing facilities for more than 200 Edmontonians early next year. And they cost a lot of money, but what is harder to tally is the amount of money that they are going to save because they that will be considerable as well. So, um, 
I'll conclude there, Mr. Mayor, thanking everyone again, uh, hoping we can see the kind of broad council support we've seen on this high priority issue. So thank you very much. Well said, Councillor. Thank you. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We're just sending the vote out now. Councillor Paquette? Yeah, I've got a spinning wheel. I am a yes. Thank you, and Councillor Walters? Yeah, I didn't get it, but I am a yes. Uh, and Councillor Essinger? I'm a yes, I didn't receive it yet, thanks. Thank you, we have all the votes. Display the vote. Carried. Unanimously. All right, next up uh, are 6 5 and 6 6, which uh, came up from Community and Public Services Committee. Um, Councillor Paquette, if you could give us a precy of the, uh, the discussion at committee, and then, uh, then we'll go from there. Yeah, so uh, we uh, heard from speakers, and um, uh, it was a pretty great conversation. Um, unfortunately, uh, no representative from Hope Mission was in attendance, but we got uh, some great information from other service providers. Um, and uh, that's about where we got to. We left off with questions for administration, which is why it's here today. Right, it was, it was requisitioned after hearing from the speakers on account of short of time, I think, so. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor McKean, you'd selected this. Sorry, technology problems trying to get the uh, <clears throat> e-scribe um, back up. But anyways, uh, if I could put the motion on the floor, I would be happy to do so, Mr. Mayor. Mm, go ahead. Yeah, and you're going to want that. Could I have that up in front of me because I'm having e-scribe issues? Yes, we will display the, the, the motion that's in the report for you. Thank you. We just... Second. Is that a... So... The motion is to receive the report for information for 6-5. I think you had other wording on shelter standards, uh, Councillor McKean. Um, Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. I certainly was going to pursue that line of questioning today about community, about uh, local um, shelter standards, but I don't have a motion before us right now. Oh, okay. I do, Mr. Mayor. Okay, well, uh, um, I, I misunderstood then, Councillor McKean. Um, well, uh, go ahead and ask questions then, or I guess receive for informations on the floor right now, uh, so then there may be some subsequent motions or, or substitute motions. We'll see how it goes, but um, if you wanna ask questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do want to ask about our ability as a city corporation to establish shelter standards um, in regards to hours, in regards to storage and such things. Do we have that legal ability to do that? Uh, Councilor McKean, I think that's a question for the, our legal branch. Maybe our reps from law can, can weigh in on that. Hi, Councillor. It's Jennifer Little from Legal Services Branch. Um, I think that uh, from the Legal Services Branch perspective, we'd need to, to weigh in and look a little bit closer on what type of controls that would possibly be within our, our toolkit in order to, to look at shelter standards. Um, in terms of our operational functions, um, some options might include, as one example, looking at our business licensing bylaw powers to regulate business activities. Um, but currently, from our business licensing standpoint, a lot of uh, conditions that are placed on certain kinds of businesses 
are fairly high level. You're looking at more like things like patron management plans, um, conditions of uh, having some sort of safety or security plan in place, as opposed to drilling down to the more fine tune points of um, hours of operation and, and really fine tune points on operational uh, requirements. Um, if we do explore regulating shelters with bylaw powers, I think we'd need to have a, a valid municipal purpose for that regulation. And on a general scale, we'd need to consider the impact of that regulation on the ongoing viability for shelter operations as well. So Jennifer, for instance, Jennifer, we can't Jennifer, it's actually uh, impossible. Jennifer, Sorry, go ahead, Mr. McKean. Yeah, that was a long answer. <laughs> um, do, do we have any ability to, um, to regulate human rights? So in the human rights field, generally that is going to fall within the provincial uh, legislative. We do have the Alberta Human Rights Act, which sets out um, provincially legislated uh, regulations. We, we don't have the ability to amend provincial legislation. So do I we, think what we would be looking Jennifer, at- uh, Jennifer, Sorry, I, your first question I think was perfect. And you said you'd have to dig into this further. And I really appreciate that. You bet. But, but the size and scale of an operation certainly is within our um, purview, it would seem to me. Um, and things like operating, uh, you used the term, and I'm forgetting what it was, but suggesting that people lining up outside in the cold might not be an operational um, procedure that we subscribe to, or evicting people before seven in the morning would be something that we don't subscribe to? Any thoughts on that? I, I think we would need to look at at the bylaw powers to see how how much we can drill down to the the operating elements of, of business. Um, I do think that there's there's some opportunity to look at, at our bylaw powers. Um, but I, I think we're we're at a high level stage right now. We haven't done a lot of uh, nuanced, detailed look into that as to how how much we could get into the day to day operational elements of of what shelter providers choose to do. I do think there is also the outside of our own bylaw powers, and if if we if we find that we aren't well positioned to develop. You know, nuanced regulatory measures generally. I do think there's ways for the city to find um, additional ways to support shelter operators who are willing to use evidence-based best practices, um, such as through land or funding contributions as well. So I think looking at how um, our Edmonton Convention Center has has been run, um, the, the novel aspect of, of that operation is with the city's involvement through the provision of land and through provision of funding, it, it positions us in a really unique place to be able to um, look at operational standards from a funding or a contribution agreement side. Um, but in terms of looking at the, the use of our bylaw powers, where we're not in the in the position of a funder or a, or a land contribution provider, I do think more detailed inquiries would need to be made there to, to see how far we could drill down into into provision of, of controls and standards. I'm uh, out of time now, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to have to come around on one other line of questioning. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Nickel. Yes, Mr. Mayor. If uh, you, I have a motion, uh, if you want to put that up, Madam Clerk. Well, so strictly is... speaking, receipt of information is on the floor. Um, oh, then this would be a replacement motion then, I guess. Well, it might just be, I think there are going to be at least two different motions depending on what yours says that would that would uh, could be subsequent or could um well uh, and it certainly put it up and then the, let the mayor make a ruling on it it's just getting to councillor McKean's and my uh, uh initial kind of interest in trying to establish some sort of investigation of shelters shelter standards so maybe if, if you want to deem it as a subsequent we could do that if once you see it so, Councillor Nickel, because there's a motion on the floor, I can't override the system, but I can put the wording in the chat if that's helpful. And, I, and I'll read it out for you. How's that? That would be uh, very Clark, helpful. Mr. Mayor. 
Sure, go ahead. And, and so that administration look at options to mitigate emergency shelter impacts on communities, including the development of minim minimum emergency shelter standards and operating requirements that can be expected of shelter operators in order to better support clients and communities and provide a report back. So would you like to do that as an amendment or as a subsequent? Um, let's just pause on that for a second. Councillor McKean, what would be cleanest is if we withdrew receipt of information and then dealt with this motion instead. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, I was uh, uh, momentarily uh, confused. I withdraw. Uh, okay, is there any objection to the withdrawal of uh, receipt of information? Not hearing any. Okay, now the deck is clear. You may make that motion, Councillor Nickel. Uh, I'll make that motion. We're just going to load it up on the system for you. Okay. Seconder? Second. Second. Councillor Cartmel. Okay. All right. That's up on the screen. Uh, carry on. Introducing it. Yeah. And just to introduce it, there was a very good discussion at committee uh, with regards to understanding kind of just the basic standards that uh, we should we should be expecting from our shelters whether or not uh, we have uh, hard, fast material remedies as, the, as our legal counsel is putting forward to us is one thing, but there's also the other side of it is, is that the, the city, and you've heard from Council McKean talk about lineups and, and, and things like that, moving people out at, seven, eight, at 6 a.m. or whatever. These don't seem to be uh, good operating procedures. And so this kind, this motion would get us towards a better, I would say, kind of an expectation of, uh, in, of course, in discussion with our shelter operators, an expectation of, of what works, what does not work, what they want to do, what they shouldn't be doing. And uh, so this is trying to get a report back to us to, to list out those things. Um, I do think we need to establish some sort of minimum standards out there in terms of not just uh, materially of what we can, but I also think we should. There's some, you know, uh, you know, fiduciary expectations that we have as well, and in doing so, I think we can get better operational models. And of course, if there's a question that they identify a shortcoming, we can uh, that needs funding or a change in regulation. Let's let's do it now. And if we have to chase money for it, let's. I'll be happy to go chase money for it. And uh, that, so that was the intent of my inquiry about establishing that, that sort of uh, minimum expectation and hopefully get better, better uh, operational outcomes. And I think, um, you know, I was talking to Dean at Mustard Seed. He thought the conversation went well, too, and they were uh, at least uh, at least Dean was happy with the direction of uh, where we were going on this. So that's to introduce it, sir. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Um, well, maybe I'll start with a question to the mover because I'm the wording of the first sentence um, seems to weight it in terms of mitigation of emergency impacts to communities, which I think is valid and needs to be looked at. But I, I think part of your intent is also uh, to provide the best um, uh, a service to the to the clients as well. And I'm wondering if that should be added to that first line in order not to weight it the wrong way. I realize you do have it later on as better support to clients, but I, um, I, I'm just a little bit nervous about the way the motion is worded in the in the first in the first sentence. Well, uh, Councillor Anderson, I have no problem with that because it is all about the clients at the yeah. end of the day. But the, the way and it's worded right now, clearly it's, my I understand that it's just not really reading that way right now. So um, I don't know what the amendment would look like. The administration look at options. Sorry, I'm having trouble reading it here. Um, uh, options to uh, to mitigate emergency shelter impacts on communities and provide better service to clients. Yeah, there's there's no problem with that if you would like that so kind I would of clarity. That's that as an amendment. I don't know if it's friendly or not. Would that oh, be, yeah, it's would friendly. Would that be a friendly change yeah. to everyone? Yeah. Okay, okay. hearing, hearing is, no objections, yeah. then make um, that adjustment so to the my, motion. So it, in terms of what we're able to do, uh, you know, following up on Councillor McKean's questions here, I mean, understanding um, that if we had skin in the game in terms of funding on this, we have more clout. And we have had skin in the game for the last year, but traditionally we haven't. But that doesn't stop us coming up with creating policy that says this is what our expectations of good, of good shelters are, correct? I mean, it, what kind of weight it would have? It would have a kind of um, 
you know, saying w this is what we think good, good shelter would be in the city. We could, it wouldn't have huge teeth, but it would have probably some moral weight. Um, uh, is that something we could look at? Yeah, point taken. I, th I think the key message we're getting is we have to take this back and, and really do yeah. some analysis of it and work with, I think the last year has really taught this sector how, how, how connected we can be. And, and the integrated services, the, the agencies are coming together more so in a crisis. But how do we sustain that integration between all of these uh, serving agencies? Yeah, I, this I, could be a part of that. I, I think my worry is that you know that there are still a lot of this has to do with the belief set of what best service is and what responsibilities are, um, which I'm not sure is shared by all providers, to be frank. And I and I realize we you know because we're not funding some of those providers, we don't have a lot of cloud. I guess what I'm wondering, but I wouldn't. I, I'm hoping that our answer wouldn't be, well, we don't have any clout, so, so there's nothing we can do around this. I, I'm wondering if one of the things we could look at is something which is a policy statement from the city about what we think good practice is, and whether that's one of the, at absolute minimum, you know, I'm just worried that we're going to come back and go, well, we can't use the zoning bylaw, we can't use this, we can't use X, and, and as a result, we won't do anything. So is that one of the things that this, you could look at with this motion, that in a worst case scenario, we can come up with some kind of statement about what we what we think good practice is. Certainly, Councillor, we can we can scope that in. And even in the last week, as we've talked about this internally, we believe there are some some good potentials to move down this this path that Councillor Nicholas put on put on the table here. And obviously, just to state the obvious a little bit, um, the other order of government obviously is the GOA that that, that is, has a lot of a lot a lot of skin in this game as well. Yeah, and and they have not had the same, you know, the kind of standards we're talking about is not, have not been shared by the GOA over time or we wouldn't be in this boat. Fair you know, enough. They'd be more than happy to, to have people, you know, for years we've known this, this problem of, of limited hours and all those other kind of things. Um, we, you know, that's not new information and, and, and yet that's where the, the, the GOA's funding is going. So that's why I'm thinking depending on, the, you know, I think we need to keep on pushing them, but the, I, I think we're, I, I guess what I'm looking for is some kind of statement on our own behalf, um, which, you know, obviously if we were prepared to come up and, and put some money in, we would have some clout. I'm not suggesting we go down that route because I think we've already been hooked into that one probably further than we should be, but, um, but it'd be nice to at least say in the city of Edmonton, this is what we think is best practice. More on the aspirational side as opposed to the authority, perhaps. Well, if we can find the authority, great. Right. I'm not saying don't go looking for the authority, but if we can't find the authority, something at minimum that says this is what we think best practice is in this city, I think we Mr. Cobalt looks at you. Yeah, I would just add, Councillor, that you know we can certainly establish the moral authority yeah. of what's right, and then we can also work with other agencies in addition to the province and us that fund, and if we can get some agreement yep. amongst third-party entities that also fund directly, we can convince them of this standard and then maybe they'll also provide leverage in their funding. And if we can create that standard collectively, you know, not just us in the city, I think that would be very helpful. Great, thanks. I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Burkett? Yeah, thank you. Um, so a, a few weeks ago we were talking about uh, this concept of housing as a human right. And uh, if I recall, there were some legal concerns with that concept and I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and the reason I ask is because I'm looking at this and I know that the government of Alberta is proud of the funding they provided for shelters and thank you very much for that but really the solution is going to be housing so I'm just wondering when we're talking about moral authority or even legal pressures where do we fall there like um, I'm assuming that this motion would not be tackling that question. So I'm just really curious about that. Maybe we'll let um, legal services weigh in on the housing as a human right um, question, and then we can weigh in on the other piece. Thank you, Rob. So housing as a human right is something that came up in a couple of discussions um, offline as, as well as in, in the previous meeting. Uh, human rights um, are generally dealt with on, on multiple levels. Um, we do have provincial human rights legislation that, that sets out human rights in a statutory form. Uh, we also have the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, at the, the federal level. But neither of these um, documents 
actually um, create a, an, an active um, human right that affordable housing as a human right. So because the municipality is not jurisdictionally in the position to amend um, Alberta human rights legislation or the charter, I don't think that we're positioned to, to make commentary on, on human rights if it's outside of our jurisdiction. That being said, I, I do believe that um, there is a lot of social discourse towards having safe and affordable housing for all. And without having to wade too deeply into a rights-based analysis, I think that pursuing a goal of housing that is safe and affordable for all is something that uh, the city as a municipality can still certainly pursue wholeheartedly. Uh, the unfortunate thing is as a municipality, we aren't positioned to uh, amend legislation. We aren't positioned to, to, to take over jurisdictional spheres that we, we don't have jurisdiction in. However, um, I do think as, as a general city approach and as a goal, having safe, affordable housing for all Edmontonians is, is a very acceptable approach to take. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so no jurisdiction, but all the responsibility. Okay, so in that vein, and uh, because I'm not sure if this motion covers it, so we cannot use that specific designation in our policies, but what can we use in our policies that may carry the same type of heft uh, going forward? and uh, making this sort of embedded so that, you know, while this motion is being worked on as far as shelter, um, embedded in our policy is the uh, um, irrefutable sense that housing is the solution. And while we cannot say a right, can we say an expectation yes. and a commitment? Fair, fair point, councillors. But council has approved some pretty strong policies on the on the housing side of the continuum. So I think those are fairly well established. Maybe I'll ask Ms. Ford or Ms. Kajena to weigh in on the on the housing. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, as they do, I, I guess my question would be: How do we take that then from just being a city of Edmonton, uh, you know, uh, statement or direction, and using it to apply more pressure? and more awareness on other levels of government. Because uh, while this motion gets to, you know, part of the issue, it doesn't get to the solution. And, and that's what I'm really hoping to get to. So if we're going to go ahead with this motion, there's got to be some way to understand that this is just dealing with some of the effects of inaction rather than the solution, which we know is housing. Certainly, Councillor, that, that, that would be the context for the work that we're doing, that shelters are not a solution. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to do ourselves out of, out of the shelter business. And I'm sure people are in bridge housing and, and permanent housing. But until we get there, we, we, do, need, we need, do need to provide that service. So I take your point about the kind of the bigger picture, if you will, about how do we really wrestle this to the ground, this whole issue. And that's really the advocacy council's been doing over the last num number of years. Um, and we, we have to keep doing that until, we, until, we don't, until everybody's housed, basically. But I, I think the point you're, I'm trying to absorb here a little bit is that that contextual piece is important for our, any kind of standards on, on shelter policies. It's got to be in that frame. But that's, just, that's just one piece of our whole body of work here. That, that lead towards permanent housing. Uh, Crystal or Jackie, do you want to quickly weigh in? Uh, uh, it's a good question, Councillor, and thanks for raising it. I think going through this motion and working on with our colleagues in law and seeing what legal tools we would have to enforce standards, and enforce is my word, not theirs, uh, to have standards. But I think if that isn't the case uh, to uh, some of the other points raised today, the framework under which we provide um, this information back, because we, we've studied these two reports will tell you what we know are best practices. If we were to codify that with a, a, a preamble of sorts, which outlines from a communications perspective, what we expect of people providing this and agencies providing this service in the city, if that was endorsed by council, that gives us some 
levers into the door in other orders of government to say, this is what we believe about this particular issue and councils, council, the weight of council is behind it. I know it's not perfect, but it's, it may be a way for us to signify exactly how strongly we feel about this. And Councillor, I would just add that um, while we can't um, certainly make law what is a human right and what's not human right because of the jurisdiction issue, I think we can get to the, the more important um, meat of the issue, which is adequate housing is essential to one's sense of dignity, safety, inclusion, and ability to contribute to the fabric of our neighbourhoods and societies. And those are things we can absolutely say in any policy statement, uh, notwithstanding our jurisdiction, I would say. Thank you, Matter Time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson, could you take the chair? Will do. So I uh, threw some text uh, for an amendment. Uh, it's in two parts, um, just to try to tidy up some of what we've talked about so far here. So I'll move uh, one that we add, including orienting service to best support transitions into housing after the words shelter operators, and two, that we add a part two to the motion that just make clear the following, that the report make recommendations for policy tools and or municipal bylaw regulatory authorities and the actions the city may take to ensure these standards are met, including but not limited to licensing and conditions and suspension of licenses. Second. And then just speaking to it, uh, uh, the first part, um, I think the, the most revealing part of the conversation was the theme, and it was a great conversation at committee about the um, uh, this notion of um, housing focused shelter. Uh, so shelter is always going to be part of the system for people who fall into short term and hopefully non recurring homelessness uh, for whatever their circumstances, but that the shelters um, uh, job, one of their main jobs uh, is to then route people back to housing as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, that the shelters and, and the cities where all of their shelter infrastructure has oriented itself that way have made better progress on this. Uh, so I think that that uh, shelter or housing focused shelter approach is uh, a critical theme that we need to emphasize. Um, and uh, they've, they've made this transition in Calgary. Their major drop-in center downtown operates this way, and it's made a huge difference um, culturally and in terms of outcomes for vulnerable people uh, and alignment with the housing ecosystem. So this is a change that that uh, needs to happen here, um, uh, and we're ideally that pressure and and inducement should come from the operators themselves, uh, and secondarily from the funder at the government of Alberta and tertiarily from us at this point. So um, we shouldn't have to have an opinion on this, but it's time for us to take a position on this. Uh, and in the part two, um, we need to consider all of the tools at our disposal, which are imperfect, and I'd love by the time this report comes back to not need this because the policy levers have been suitably uh, aligned uh, at the among the ecosystem of service providers here as well as from the principal funders at the province that this is redundant by the time it gets to us because the notion of having to create shelter red tape to get better outcomes for vulnerable people when the best practices are well illustrated in uh, or uh, the other large Alberta city to the south I think I'd, I'd rather not go there however if we, uh, I think we have to keep all our options on the table at this point and really see what the tools in the toolkit could be. So, uh, so just to uh, add a little um, specificity around tools and uh, housing uh, focused shelter services, um, I offer these amendments to, uh, uh, to, to the conversation. Happy to take questions. Great, thanks. So the amendments are on the table. Councillor McKean, do you have questions about the amendments? No, uh, well, yeah, I guess I do, but I also have my own amendment. Uh, well, um, why, don't, why don't we deal with this amendment first? So why don't you go ahead with questions about this one, and then we can come back around once this one's dealt with, I think. Unless, I think that's probably the best way. I don't think we should be stacking amendments. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. Um, I guess my question is, and I don't know who would answer this, but I know the Macaulay Community League and the Central McDougall Community League and the Chinatown Business Association have been frustrated by the operations of our largest shelter. And as far as I know, there might have been some outreach, but I don't think we've 
that that project, the expansion or refurbishment project, has gone through any sort of public engagement. Can you do you know whether it did, Ms. Jenner or Ford or Smythe, Mr. Smythe? Maybe Crystal, you can weigh in. Sure. Um, so uh, there would have been only very limited engagement, I think, in terms of the. Um, zoning piece with respect to those specific stakeholders. However, I know Homer Trust has engaged those stakeholders um, a few years ago when we hired a, when they had hired a, um, a, a group that specializes in housing focused shelter to bring a report with recommendations to augment the Herb Jameson design. So part of that would have included engaging with those stakeholders um, as well. Uh, we, the province has told us, the government of Alberta has told us that they plan to um, arrange a shelter uh, service design delivery committee that will include a range of stakeholders. They have not determined which stakeholders at this point, um, but there's a possibility that they could also be engaged through that process as well. It might be interesting to compare and contrast that with the public engagement we're doing in communities like Westmount, where there was no rezoning required. Uh, and yet we're doing pretty significant public engagement in there. And I think uh, it is incumbent on us um, to make sure that there's good public engagement done on that project. And maybe this motion will change some of those outcomes. But um, I think, Mr. Acting Chair, I'll have to come around with my amendment. No, nope, that's, that's, nope, that's perfectly appropriate. So we'll deal with this you. one and then... You will, you'll get back your real chair and you can do your amendment. Thank um, you. Uh, Councillor Nickel, do you have questions about the amendment? Yes, to the mover, just clarity on the, but not limited to the licensing and conditions and suspensions of licenses. Uh, would you care to explain that further to me? I just, uh, it, it all looks good to me. I just want clarification as to your intent. Well, we, we've heard that, uh, and thank you for the question, we've heard that there may be a number of different tools um, under bylaw powers for regulation for a valid municipal purpose, and the administration needs to do some more analysis on that, but I can think of lots of health and safety and social disorder um, um, outcomes that are valid municipal policy uh, bases to, to regulate these. The same way we would regulate um, you know, occupancy, uh, though those are safety code issues, but, you know, w when we regulate um, lice and licensed businesses, for example, uh, we have valid public safety um, reasons for doing so. And when those, uh, you know, think of the pizzerias that turn out to be uh, fronts for something illicit and they're not operating in accordance with their, their businesses or with their licensing, you know, at, we found ourselves historically... Um, disempowered to do anything about those businesses until we took it upon ourselves to to put conditions on licenses or even revoke license suspend and revoke licenses if we had substantial non-compliance and that's been held up by the court so the question is could we use that tool in this case if there are uh, problematic social disorder or public safety uh, issues arising from from shelter operations um, and we had valid municipal reason to be regulating them so I, I'm not in a position to say whether we can or can't today but it sounded like law was willing to look at that so it's an including but not okay. limited to because if there are other different tools available to us I would want all the options and recommendations that's just that would be the hammer essentially but again I'd rather avoid going down the sort of red tape category for shelters uh, because we were all getting the outcomes that we wanted. Yeah, I, 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 yeah Mr. Mayor, I was just concerned uh, that I prefer carrots to sticks with regards to this file. So, but I, I, I agree with you, you know, land use considerations, concentration of use are also within our realm of powers, as you know, as a zoning and so on. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Councillor McKean, I'm going to assume you're on to come back with your amendment after the fact. Is that correct? That's true. Okay. That's true. Uh, then, uh, is there anybody else on the amendment? Mayor Iverson to close. Sure. Uh, just a couple more comments arising from the conversation here. Again, I, I would think these are these are measures we wouldn't want to have to look towards, uh, except in the most extreme circumstances um, of of, of non-compliance and. Um, 
and, and real strong misalignment with community safety and social disorder issues. Um, but we have had those concerns over time as well. And um, so I do think, especially from what we've heard from Chinatown historically, uh, that there is an opportunity to do better here. Um, but, and, I, and I'd rather get there with all the carrots in the world. Um, but sometimes you gotta take the carrot away as well if, um, if you're not getting what you need. You don't keep feeding the beast if it's not doing what you need. So, um, um, so we're, we're uh, unfortunately, we're not the supplier of the carrots, the province is. Um, and the stick only is the thing that the carrot hangs from. Um, unless it's really bad, I guess you beat the horse with that. But I'd rather not go down that path. I'd rather get funders, providers, uh, and, and the city and, and, and all the King's horses and all the King's men pulling in the same direction on a housing focused shelter that meets people where they're at. And, and uh, I would say the one other thing is that, uh, and uh, was Mr. Cooper White made a great point about needing a variety of different shelters in the mix that meet people. You need some dry shelters for people who want to be away from alcohol as part of their sobriety and their recovery. And then there are other places where if you turn people away because of the distress that they're in, then they're going to wind up at the hospital or they're going to wind up dead. And, um, and we can do better than that. But we need to get the system tuned up. And, and I think uh, this is an opportunity for us to help uh, put some guardrails in on what that looks like. Um, but again, I'd much rather wind up not needing to take any of these kinds of uh, harsher measures in part two because we're getting everything we want uh, for vulnerable people and the agencies and frontline people who do work with vulnerable people and for the communities where, where these services are offered. So that is achievable. Other places have done it, so including within Alberta. So um, only just as a last resort to understand what our, uh, what our regulatory instruments are under part two. Thank you. Please, on the amendment only, uh, please vote. The vote is yes. Just, the vote is just coming to you now. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. I'm a yes. Thank, thank, Walter. thank you, Councillor Walters. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Carina. Councillor Banga. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Councillor Essinger. Yes. And Councillor Hamilton. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. And the amendment is carried. I will pass it back to you, and it passed unanimously. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, Councillor McKean, you had another amendment? I do. I don't know if the clerk can put that up yet. Madam Clerk? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Finally, would be another point on this, and an analysis or options to deal with people who are evicted or banned from shelters after supporting clients and communities. So that would be part of the report coming back. Second. Thank you. The reason I raise this, it's been a really tough couple of weeks, in particular in the downtown. And um, uh, I'm hearing from residents who are being um, really scared and businesses that are being impacted by um, street people, street involved people. So, and one of the, and I don't know this Mr. Smythe to be true, but I will ask you, is it true that there are people being um, banned or evicted from the Edmonton Convention Center shelter? Uh, maybe I'll pass it over to one of my colleagues who is more directly involved. Uh, Crystal, you might have that kind of detail. 
Sure. So um, in setting up the Tippinawa shelter, Tippinawa at the convention center, administration asked the operators to um, create very clear standards and criteria for when bans would be considered. And there is a sort of, I think it's a three level ban system that's in place. Um, um, so most of the bans are 24 hours or three days, uh, depending on the nature of the behavior. But in the rare instance of um, specifically very violent or threatening or, um, behavior, then it is possible that someone would be banned for a longer period of time. Um, that Those ban procedures are made in consultation with a banning uh, committee or group that can review them. And there's usually also a uh, provision around ensuring that people have um, amnesty back. But I mean, I guess to put a finer point on it in relation to the amendment, there are people that are banned from all uh, shelters in Edmonton currently. So and I, you know, and I have some comfort that that is done on a human rights lens. Um, and I maybe have been a little bit naive in my um, advocacy for the homeless population, not recognizing that there are some in there, probably a small minority that cause a lot of problems. And so uh, whether they need, um, you know, some of them may have extreme mental illness or other issues and, you know, um, a psychiatric hospital is maybe where these folks need to be going. And I think we need to know options on how we can deal with folks who are being banned regularly or evicted regularly from shelters, who may be a threat to homeless people, number one. And then as a, as a, as a side effect or, or a, uh, a threat to community, I just, I, I'm, I'm just struggling with the amount of, um, I'll just use the polite term social disorder we have in and around that convention center right now. And, and Mr. Smythe, if I asked you, uh, it's an unfair question, but I'm going to ask you, when those people are banned from the convention center, where do they go? What, what's our next offer for them? Oh, fair point, Councillor. Um, basically, they're not allowed in the building, and, and for the most part, they're on their own. They're on their own to determine what their next steps are. And so, I don't want to conflate anything with a recent event, but they may end up in our LRT entrances, that sort of thing, where residents are going down to use the LRT, and that's where it seems to me there's been quite a bit of conflict. And then there's been conflict break-in attempts with buildings and hotels, and like I just think you know we all have to be. I'm, I'm introducing this, Mr. Mayor. I, 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 I feel a tremendous sense of empathy for those that we have not properly looked after. And, and for the most part, we're starting to do that. And I'm very comfortable that with our vetting process, the people going into our supportive housing facilities will, will thrive and will not be a problem for the surrounding neighborhoods. But we have some people who are a problem for, for other homeless people and for the community. And we need options on how best to deal with that. And we have to involve the provincial government in those conversations, I think, because it, it might be an issue. We don't want people involved with the criminal justice system or to go out to psychiatric hospitals, but those are maybe the kind of options we also need to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Burkett. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this amendment. Um, I, as you were speaking, Councillor McKean, I was thinking about uh, back when Ralph Klein was giving a one-way ticket out for uh, folks that he deemed undesirable, sending them to BC. Well, that didn't solve the problem. Uh, it's always going to be with us until we actually put in the systems to deal with this. So this was part of it. And part of the frustrating thing uh, about dealing with this issue and, and this gets to my question, is the fact that we don't have control over mental health supports. And uh, we don't have control over the um, financial obligations that might be inherent in uh, reconciliation work based on the TRC's uh, uh, report. So I'm just wondering, from an administrative standpoint, what can we do? What do we need to do as far as advocacy and do we have any tools uh, for mental health supports? Do we have any tools for pressuring for adequate resources for this reconciliation work? Uh, 
Jackie, can you weigh in on that? I mean, there are some wheels in motion, certainly, Councillor, but Jackie can speak to what those are. You're asking all the tough questions today, Councillor. The, uh, that, is a, that is a difficult, we don't have a lot of levers to, to pressure um, mental health supports in this province. And we also know from our work with various shelters and other communities, uh, buildings where people were living and had super high needs and they closed, there really literally was nowhere for them to go in our discussions with Alberta Health Services. So it may be a, a broader issue that InterGov would be able to manage and try to help us work through. But in some cases, to Councillor McKean's point, some folks really do need in-person or in-house uh, mental health supports. That means hospitalization. Some, unfortunately, the criminal justice is going to have to deal with but in terms of our levers, I, it, it is all city advocacy again, um, which is kind of sounding like I've said that again today. But it really is a matter of us trying to push our case collectively, whether it's counselors or administration, to how we can make the system better for these folks. And just further, um, go ahead, go ahead, Crystal. Sure, and I would just quickly add, Councillor Paquette, that this isn't a new issue, and it's certainly something that the sector overall has advocated around and pointed out. And the city has been supportive of initiatives in the past that have targeted at this. Like one that comes to mind is the Heavy Users of Service Initiative, which was a pilot program led by the Edmonton Police, um, bringing together a whole bunch of agencies to look at the folks that, um, you know, demand the most calls for service and certainly a number of them would have been banned from shelter or you know had a tr had trouble accessing other supports the challenge is the interventions just need to be very personalized um, so it could be something like a group home scenario where only three people live or like a very personalized targeted issue or scenario or intervention rather uh, the challenge is though at the city you know within its limited mandate um, it's those in interventions are are ultimately healthcare interventions and are very expensive. And so that's sort of where we um, hit, in, hit a bit of a roadblock, if that makes sense. And I do think, Councillor, with this, with this motion that Councillor McKean has put on the table, I mean, that'll allow us to then map that process and understand it better, and then to look at what some of those options might be that my colleagues have just spoken to. Okay. Oh, did this, did, did this amendment get a seconder? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so I'm wondering if it would be useful to, to be specific in our language uh, about uh, mental health supports, about reconciliation efforts, about um, human rights protections for LGBTQ2S people and religious freedoms, all of these things that we know are feeding into the problem, should we be uh, identifying them in our wording in order to be more specific and to provide clarity? Uh, to the public and to other levels of government that we are aware of these things and they should be aware of them too. I, Councillor, if, if you allow me, uh, you know, this started off with standards for shelters. Um, we can scope that in. And I think it, maybe that as a, as a second step perhaps, once council gets back this information, might be a, might be a, a, a way to go. But there's still a, a significant amount of work to do to bring this information back in June. So, sure. you know, but I, I, I just think that that should be if we're talking about minimum standards, that should be a, a minimum. No nope. uh, point taken, but we, we can absorb that. I mean, based on this discussion, we'll, we're taking notes here and, and we can we can scope that into our into our research, if you will. And then if it then once council sees the results of our work, we can then go down, go down a, a path based on council's direction then. Well, I, I would have a lot more comfort if we added in uh, that wording today, but I'm out, of, I'm out of time. Thank you. Any other questions on uh, Councillor McKean's amendment? If, if uh, a second round is okay, I've got a quick question for Councillor McQueen. McQueen, McQueen I, I'm thinking of him as a uh, old man. I'll, need a, uh, I'll yeah. need a motion for a second round. I'll move a second I'll round for, on the amendment. Thank you, uh, Councillor Henderson. Second. Uh, seconded by Councillor Knack. Please vote. Yes. Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes. Thank you. We're just sending the vote out now.
We have all the votes. Display the vote. Carried. Um, okay, go ahead. Councilor oh, Scott. thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, for Councillor Scott, Steve McQueen McKean, <laughs> uh, got a, um, what do you think of that, um, the possibility of, of being specific in the language, or do you think that uh, um, there wouldn't be much utility to that? Well, actually, I wasn't sympathetic to start with because I was more or less talking about people who preyed upon other homeless people or preyed upon the community, and we needed better um, options for those people because maybe they're, they have serious psychiatric illnesses. But I see now what you're, you're suggesting, they got banned because they're Indigenous, they got banned because they're LB, LGBTQ. I am completely sympathetic to that. I don't know if this is the right place in the motion for it, and I might defer to the chair, who's much better at that, because I think I have 100 or so um, homeless LGBTQ folks in Oliver, for example who have, feel like they have no place to go. So I'm very sympathetic with what you're trying to do. I just don't know where in the motion it fits best. Right, well, so it could be something completely different. Uh, so yeah, I, I wouldn't mind uh, hearing from the chair on that if there's any, any input. I think it's best handled as a separate amendment at this point, um, rather than amendment to the amendment. So um, just, just because it may apply either as a, maybe best organized as a point three in the overall motion, uh, or tucked in in a different place than what Councillor McKean is modifying, because he's just uh, referencing the evictions clients, and I wouldn't want the points you're raising to be only in the context of the eviction. So my guidance would be, um, in this instance, let's deal with Councillor uh, McKean's specific point here and then if there's value uh, and a desire to add um, additional um, notes about sensitivities uh, uh, in the standards then then I think we can make a separate amendment for that. Okay that makes sense yeah and part of the goal is just to humanize uh, you know we, we say homeless and then it just becomes this like amorphous sort of concept but if we can uh, identify, then we humanize is sort of my, uh, my perspective here. Okay, so I'll work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on the amendment that's on the floor? Anyone else wishing to speak to it? Councillor McKean to close. Just very quickly, Mr. Mayor, I'm reminded that uh, state governments and provincial governments I think it was in the 80s, started to shutter major psychiatric hospitals. And the promise was the community supports would be there. And um, they weren't. Uh, and for a lot of other reasons coming together, we have a huge homeless problem. Uh, but part of that problem is some particularly challenging folk who cause problems for, uh, yes, shelters and communities and businesses, in our, in our city, but also cause problems for other homeless people. So it seems to me that we need, we need some options, uh, whether it's advocacy or not, or directions to the police, that if we have people like that, they get taken directly to the emergency wards at the hospitals so that the, um, the responsible order of government is asked to deal with those issues. But we need those options because we're trying to deal with a problem that looking at it uh, as, a, as an, a whole, and it's complicated. I mean, it's super complicated, but this is another complication that I would like us to dig into a little bit more because um, I'm seeing the results of it in the word I represent right now. And um, at the same time, we're doing an amazing job of sheltering people uh, through a tough winter. But um, the, the side effects are, are, we could lose the plot here if we don't deal with the side effects because to, to many of the people complaining to me, the people that they've run into, those are the homeless. And I would argue they're a small minority, but they're causing problems 
and they will cause problems for uh, councils down the road if we don't find options. So hence my amendment. I hope you can support it. Thank you. Yes, Madam okay. Clerk. All right, please please vote on the amendment. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. You probably have so many of them now. Thank you. Just to confirm, Councillor Paquette, you voted for this already? Uh, yeah, it's a spinning wheel, so yes. Thank you. And we've got your vote, affirmative, Councillor Katarina. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. Um, and uh, um, City Manager Corbold had a thought on the previous line of questions. Yes, thanks, Your Worship. I just wanted to point out that um, we could certainly um, take any details in, in the questioning, but I just want to point out no matter what we're asked to do, we have a duty and an obligation to do a full GBA plus analysis on all of this. So that would include uh, everything I think uh, um, has been mentioned in the the, the next, if we're looking at an, another motion, it doesn't matter if we, we can certainly um, explain it out, but we have an obligation to do that anyways, just based on our own internal policies we have that we're, we're directed by council. So we have to answer those questions regardless of whether it's in the motion or not. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, is there anyone else on the speakers list? Councillor Paquette? Yeah, I just, uh, I just really want to nail this down. Um, I understand that uh, conceptually we do that, but I'm wondering, again, if there's a utility in actually stating that we will. Um, you know, this goes beyond just sort of the internal work, but uh, also as a communication tool both for the public and for other levels of government to show that these are specific things that that we are identifying that these are uh you know rather than just being folded into the work in sort of that nameless way that homelessness tends to fall under that we are saying these are groups and these are areas of uh of uh interest and, and vulnerabilities that we are targeting because we need to because these are some of the causes for people to be without houses without a place to live so I'm just wondering if there is a utility in making it specific. I, I think, Councillor, that, that's very much City Council's um, decision. Um, you know, as directed by City Council, we'll roll up our sleeves and get to work. So I think it's very much in, in, in your wheelhouse to, to move that forward. Okay, well then, uh, I mean, my wording isn't great because I just did this on the fly, then I would propose this amendment, uh, maybe in item three if it works, uh, that a strategy be developed with regard to the need for mental health supports, reconciliation efforts, LGBTQ2S plus human rights and equity through the GBA plus lands. And I, I sent that wording in, but just really quick, because this all happened in the space of a couple of minutes. With respect to shelter standards? Yeah. I'll second it to get it on the floor for Councillor Paquette. Okay. Um, Thank you. And just to quickly introduce it, everything I just said, uh, just that uh, I think that by naming things, we give power to it, and uh, by... Uh, identifying things, then uh, it's harder to ignore. Um, we might as well daylight uh, the issues that are surrounding this. And uh, um, I think that being being clear is a kindness. So that's it. Question, Councillor Paquette, it's Catherine. Would that be an advocacy strategy? Is, is that your intent? Uh, well, one part of it uh, is an informal advocacy strategy, but the other, uh, that strategy, I guess, um, maybe, and that's not the best wording, but as far as uh, these minimum standards for shelters are concerned, uh, 
if we're talking about minimum standards, we have to be talking about these issues um, because these are the contributing factors to people having no houses to live in and contributing factors that people find themselves in shelters in the first place or contributing factors to them uh, not being in a shelter, uh, depending on the specific outlooks of uh, certain people or places. Uh, you know, we know that these are issues, so I'm not sure why we wouldn't want to just put it out there and say, look, we're aware of it, let's shine some light on it, and in that way, uh, we don't miss it. Councillor Henderson. Well, um, despite, I'm, I'm supportive of, of, of doing this, but it seems to me I worry that it's, a di it's, different. It's, it's, it's different from the intent of the original motion, which was very specific to look at standards around how we're operating shelters in this city. And this seems to be to move to the equally important but much larger issue of homelessness and causes for homelessness. So. You know, it strikes me, and I wouldn't mind a ruling on this, that this would probably be more appropriate as a subsequent than as part of the original motion. I, I just worry, that, I worry that it'll, risk, it'll misdirect from the real intent of the original motion, which was fairly, and I wouldn't mind administration's thinking on this, which was fairly specifically about how do we make sure that the shelters that we have are serving people um, to an acceptable level of, of standard. And I, this seems to be more about looking at some of the causal pieces than how we respond to the cause. So thought, I, thoughts from administration? Uh, the one, the one, one word that kind of jumps out at me is, is the notion of a strategy. I mean, if we were to develop our, our recommended, shall we call them standards for shelters with due regard for mental health supports, reconciliation efforts, and so on, but it's it's around the yeah, notion absolutely. of yeah absolutely okay of that I can see all right yeah it just seems generic to me so uh, it, it and and yeah and which is not that it's it's not something worth doing or that it should be done it's just whether or not how it ties into the to the fairly specific intent of the original motion is what I'm struggling with and that's but maybe I'm misreading it well I. I I've heard two things to answer your question for a ruling. One is specifically with respect to establishing um, standards that meet people across all of these contributing factor realities. And that is germane, I think, to the original motion. However, the strategy part it could has also been interpreted as more broadly around communications, which I think is a separate question. Um, from this and so having heard both it's difficult to to rule but I heard a willingness from the mover to treat it as a subsequent so um, and I think that might give an opportunity to to flesh out what the scope of uh, a strategy would be um, and I mean it past a certain point it might be just as subsequent to what we just dealt with in Westmount as well so I think my not ruling per se, because I think it could be challenged either way, but my kind suggestion as your humble uh, pilot would be to pull this back and work on the wording a little bit through the meeting here to, to find precisely which of the either broader uh, housing and contributing factors, needs-based issues, or specific shelter standards, or both, and then, and then mount it as a subsequent, which I think the mover was okay with, so. Yeah, one hundred percent okay with that. Happy to withdraw for now. Okay. Okay. That, 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 I, I think it'd be easier. To, I just worry that we're, we're muddying the waters on the original motion. Okay. Well, is there any so. objection to withdrawal? Okay. Not hearing any, then uh, we can take uh, wording offline for for the moment and come back to the motion as amended. Uh, are there any other questions or amendments on the shelter? standards motion not seeing any anyone wishing to speak to it before i go to councillor nickel to close uh councillor henderson if you could take the chair will do uh just one thought additional to um what we've talked about already here which is that 
uh, one of the other themes that we, we glanced at a bit today, but that was very, very strong and, and eye-opening and in the discussion last week, um, or the week before, I guess, actually, uh, was that um, scale is a factor here, and, and too small is inefficient to run. Too big is impersonal and also challenging to maintain um, uh, both personability to actually reach people and get people services, and then also, frankly, past a certain point to maintain order. Uh, and I think that's, um, uh, you know, there was some discussion around the sweet spot being in the 50 to 100 sort of size, and that larger than that starts to be issues. And I would say, in fairness, that's been, that's been one of our learnings from Tapinawao. As necessary as it was as an interim measure, that's not a scale that I think we would want to uh, continue with um, uh, longer than absolutely needed under sort of once in a lifetime pandemic urgency situation. So, so um, one of the uh, factors that I think is included in um, in the discussion from committee to inform the interpretation of the motion here. So this is not to bring an amendment, but is that those scale questions are real. Uh, and they arise in part because what what hope is building and what the government of Alberta has signaled funding um, may not be at a scale where the best outcomes are going to be achieved. Now, those decisions have been made by the by the agencies and by the governments, um, but I do think it is important to flag that. Um, you know, I think we all. Ex expect that there will be work for shelters to do again on a transitional housing basis and that hopefully the need won't be for hundreds of beds but dozens of beds in the fullness of time on a very short-term basis and that these facilities that exist and do very important work will be able to pivot to that um, uh, housing supportive shelter model um, and that the capacities might actually come down over time because uh, people are turning over faster, which I think would be great. So having even a transition model to that from the current kind of warehouse configuration, which I'm not convinced is, it may get short-term value for money in terms of dollars per head, but it's not going to generate the housing outcomes. And that was really powerful testimony from uh, Mustard, uh, Boyle, Bissell, and Bentero, uh, and our folks, uh, and Homeward Trust who've been uh, still doing their best to, to connect with people um, and refer them to housing uh, down at uh, Tepinawau. Um, so just, just a note that scale is the other piece of the puzzle here that uh, might not be a regulatory question, um, but it certainly is an, an efficacy um, question arising from the good discussion at committee. So I just wanted to flag that one other factor that we haven't dwelt on as much um, and appreciate the discussion today um, as well as the discussion the other week. And once again, finally, uh, the, the work that the uh, agency partners are all doing on the front line, hope included at, at Commonwealth and, and, and in their traditional facilities, everybody's doing extraordinary work under really exhausting circumstances uh, and, and where people have put their health on the line to do it. So hats off to everybody uh, doing that work in our community, the vulnerable people they're serving. Take the chair back. All yours. Councilor McKean. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I did want to speak to this. I also want to thank Dean from Mustard Seed and Jordan from Boyle Street Gary from Bissell, who came out to our committee meeting, and that was uh, that was a, a first. Um, not something they've been comfortable in doing to this point, but our major shelter, uh, Hope Mission, uh, has been a problem. And I've said that, that our shelter system is broken. I said that, I don't know how many times I've said that. There are people who work at Hope Mission who are doing amazing work. And in, in their milieu, they're, do, they're doing God's work. And I understand it. My bias is with sort of uh, momentum, an institutional way of doing business that, had, that I believe has to change. Mr. Mayor, you mentioned the size of the place. But part of the problem is the lineups to get in, in even really cold weather. That is demeaning and dehumanizing. Um, evicting people early morning before 7 a.m. into a world that isn't even open yet and has created nothing but conflict, conflict all over our city. 
with um, people going to work, businesses trying to operate uh, with police officers and other first responders. <clears throat> you know, um, the story I was told was that shelters really were for the guy who came to town with a bit of money to get a job in Edmonton, couldn't get enough money together for a damage deposit and stayed at the shelter for a few weeks, got his feet on the ground and then took off. They were not designed for people with complex mental health and addiction illnesses. And yet that's what they've ended, that's what this has ended up being. <clears throat> it, and, and, and at the scale that hope has had, it's just not worked. And I would argue is actually perpetuated homelessness because of uh, re-traumatization of those people and also night after night after night of poor sleep. Any of us after a night or two of poor sleep is not going to be at our best. And you can imagine people with underlying mental health issues, um, serious mental health issues, also getting bad night's sleep after bad night's sleep after bad night's sleep. And it's it has real health and mental health impacts on them. We can and should do better as a community. And I'm really hoping that we can get our major shelter provider to to come along with us on these improved ways of doing things for the sake of people that uh, unfortunate people who are relying on shelters. I also, as a, with my amendment, think we need to look at people who have perhaps been uh, exploiting others, maybe even a danger to others. And what is our strategy for folks like that? They may be um, treated for a time at a psychiatric hospital and come out and be way better. And in some cases, some of them may actually have to be filtered through the criminal justice system because they are predators. Um, but, but we've just, you know, <clears throat> quoting Councilor Paquette talking about this amorphous group of people. Um, and less than until we can deal with them in, in smaller groups and in, on an individual basis in a lot of cases, we would just continue to repeat this pattern of homelessness and social disorder and crime and urban decay that has been haunting this city and other cities across North America for decades. So, you know, I'm really proud of our administration and the advice they've given us and proud of this council. You know, I think we over the last couple of terms under your leadership, uh, Mayor Iveson, we've really come a long way and we, but man, we still got a lot of work to do and I hope we're all I hope we're all up for it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Any other thoughts before I go to Councillor Nickel to close on the amended motion? Not hearing any, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Iveson. And thank, thank you everyone for your amendments and comments. So kind of the logic why I wanted to talk about minimum standards and I launched the inquiry was I asked myself a very basic question. If I was hired tomorrow to open a shelter, what would I do? Where would I get my money? What kind of standards do I have to meet to do this in a compassionate and responsible fashion? And so there's the question. What's the standard that should be met? Now, I may have one standard and another person may have another standard. That's no good. As we all know, that will not work. We need to set some sort of minimum standard, either by expectation or by whatever authority we may have. And in doing so, we can, we can get better outcomes. And the additions to the motions are all really uh, good. They're great. They speak to moving just from the shelters and moving people along this continuum of care. Because as we've heard today, you know, Councillor McKean's addition at the end was a very good one because there will be a proportion of the population or the clients that that will be nothing but problems. And then you have the other extension of the continuum where people just need a hand up to get them in a place where a good place uh, where they can be self-sustaining because we all want to be compassionate in our response. But let me let me tell you kind of some of the stories I've gotten from uh, dealing with um, uh, some of the issues of homelessness in my ward. For example, when I asked, and I raised this point with the mustard seed, uh, when I asked them uh, how many times a day they were feeding them before they did the Cisco bill, and they were only feeding them once a day. And I said, well, 
that's no good. I mean, they need three meals a day, don't you think? And maybe that would reduce some of the wanderings that are going around if people are hungry. Number two, why are we throwing them out so early? If anybody needs more sleep, it's these folks. These are very basic kind of mechanical things that just need to be, these are our expectations, these are our standards. It's not like we're reinventing the wheel with regards to best practices. But I think it's time now to set an Edmonton standard and uh, that we cannot just um, not just uh, approve or promote. But as soon as you set an expectation, be it implied or otherwise, you can build support around it. And so, I, like I said before, if it is a question of how many meals a day do you need to uh, need that the city of Edmonton expects you to feed them, which would be a good practice. How much does that cost? Then you go out the door and then you go ask for some money, be it from the from government or the private sector to do so. But once you set expectations and you set those standards, then you can begin to construct solutions. Now it is it is complicated. I get that, but. As we've heard here today as well, leaving people standing out in the cold and lining up to get into a 300-person shelter, I probably think we can do a better model than that. I think the operations need to be fixed. Size does matter with regards to these. And just think about throwing 300 people in a room with the varying degrees of issues. That, that doesn't work for me. I don't know, it, uh, it makes me a lot of sense. It probably doesn't work for a lot of other people too. So these are the some of the things that I wanted to get towards because I just wanted to answer the question. If you were going to go out there and set up a shelter, what is expected, at least from the minimum, the basic minimum we have to do to make sure these people are taken care of. And then once we have that, we can grow that and we can build upon that as the clients and the people who are very diverse very diverse in their needs can be addressed. But without a minimum standard uh, or minimum expectation across the board, I think we're setting ourselves up for a continuous failure. And uh, I know that's not our intent and people have done a good job with what they had, but I think now's the time. Now is the time to set that standard, set those expectations. And from that point, we can actually start building and improving the operational models. Thank you. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes, for yes. me. Yes, it's Michael Walters. We're 10. Thank you. We're just, yeah. Yeah. We're just sending the vote out just now. So if you could just give us a second, please, so I don't miss anybody's vote. Councillor Zadek, was that you voting in the affirmative? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. to confirm, Councillor Paquette? I'm trying. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. That takes us to 611. Uh, straight to questions. I just have. I, I don't Sorry, need a presentation. can I just check? Yeah. Are we voting on six point six? Oh, I guess we need a receipt of information on six I'll, I'll six. I'll move to receive that for information. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Second. Seconded by Councillor uh, Cartmel. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes. Yes. Councillor Paquette? <laughs> it's dancing around. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried. All right. Uh, on council initiatives, Councillor Henderson. Go ahead with questions. Yeah, I've some really... short opening remarks. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Sure, go ahead. 
Um, good afternoon, your worship council. Thank you for your comments in the recent survey for council initiatives. We appreciated the time you took to share your feedback. Your insights have informed the recommendations of this report and will inform any recommendations administration provides to the next council on the future of initiatives. We heard a number of key themes in your responses. Uh, the first, that there is a desire for councillors to have a mechanism to be able to champion, elevate, or lend support to areas of interest. Generally, there is a desire to have the work continue, although it may be time to reset some of the approaches. It's important we don't lose progress made thus far or have key initiatives or other issues fall off the table. And there is a desire for the focus to remain and for councillors to be connected to this work, even if the work is being assumed by administration largely. We appreciate the work you've done to elevate these initiatives and the progress that's been made on these substantive issues to date. We're very happy to provide administrative support to close out these initiatives that you decide to over the course of the next few months, but ensure they keep moving forward as part of our daily business. We'll also support the incoming council after the fall election as they decide on the best approach for initiatives to advance. This will be part of a formal part, sorry, this will be a formal part of the election transition plan, which I anticipate bringing forward to council for consideration in June. So we're now happy to take your questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Henderson, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I really, and I, I, hearing what you're saying, I, I only have one slight concern, and it's not that it needs to say as an initiative, I understand why it would come off, but my concern is about a public engagement and what happens. And the reason I ask is because uh, what we have been calling the Guiding Coalition was very specifically set up to have three different kind of voices at the table, and Council was one of those voices, not as an influencer, but because our perspective of public engagement is different from both administration and the public's. And the original principle of the work is we needed to be able to, un each, each group needed to be able to understand that the other ones was slightly different. So my worry is by taking public, uh, the public engagement off the table, Councillor Knack and I have been attending those guiding coalition meetings. And I think guiding coalition would say it's really important to keep a council voice there so that a council perspective can be articulated, because we take a lot of responsibility for public engagement through our roles, and they're different. So I really just wanted to flag how we see that moving forward. I have no trouble with saying the initiative probably can be handled in different ways, but I'm worried that that means that that third you know, leg of the stool um, will, will come out of the discussion which has been designed to allow all three parties to, uh, to, to continue to hear from each other. So that's my one reservation. reservation. Yeah, and I would say, Councillor, that that's a really good example of something that doesn't need to be initiative, yeah. an initiative to carry on, and we see the importance of that involvement. But we will there. need it. We, the trouble is, if it's not an initiative, what is the mechanism whereby Council continue, can continue to participate in that group? And um, that's one of the things yeah. the initiative has allowed us to do was it's not about driving the bus and by any means on the initiative. It's simply about and I would and I would say the poverty elimination is the same. The fact that it's an initiative allows councillors to stay on that on that stewardship committee. And do I'm you, not sure what other mechanism we would have if that wasn't the case. Ms. Owen, do you want to uh, answer I, that? I was just gonna say, is it not possible to have terms of reference for for the guiding coalition, for example? that states that that uh, valued voice of councillors is important. As long as it's taken care of, that's, that's really my concern. I, I don't want to break that, and I, and I think that expectation needs to be there on the next council, that they need to put someone there, or there'll be a, there'll be a set of voices that are equal voices. I mean, there, it's, not about, it's not about authority. It's just about making sure the perspective is at the table. And we can make sure that happens as we sunset this. We can make that clear. Yeah, and I, and I think it's going to come up with some of the others that you may look at uh, again. Uh, again, I think, um, it, and, poverty, uh, and, and, and Poverty Edmonton is the same thing. We just need to keep a voice at the table. Um, you know, the arts, heritage, and culture, we just need a mechanism for keeping, keeping someone at the table, um, counselors. So there's a few of them that don't need, to, don't need huge support, but we need to understand that they're, they're you know, they're, they're, they're filling that role of, of giving us a governance reason to have someone there because the governance is complicated when you put councillor councils on a committee that is sort of in part administrative. No, certainly noted, and we will make sure that's part of the transition. Okay. All right, good. Then I'm fine with this. Do you want to move the recommendation? Sure. Uh, understanding that 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 uh, it's not about removing councils councils from that this 
discussion in the public engagement piece, I'm happy to move through. And that, that will come up on some of the other ones, which we'll get a chance to talk about further before they get wound out anyway. It's really Second. just the three we're winding okay. down, right? So that's seconded by Councillor McKean. Okay. Was, that was a question. I think Miss Owen looked like she was going to jump in on that, or did I? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, it and I'm, I'm happy to move it with that understanding. She's nodding. Let the record show. Um, noblesse Owen. It's like noblesse oblige, but better. Um, any other? Um, <laughs> any other questions on this one, Councillor Knack? Uh, just briefly to speak to Mr. Mayor. Go. Uh, uh, is there? Are there any other questions before we get into speaking? Not seeing any. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Knack. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And sorry, I, I just I did feel I, I should speak to it, being that, uh, and I appreciate Councillor Henderson's point on the public engagement, but recognizing there's a way forward. I, I wanted to briefly just comment around the. Um, concluding Edmonton Next Gen, uh, and I know you obviously were heavily involved with that at the beginning, along with uh, former Councillor Cruchel, and I've been fortunate to, to be on that for the last seven and a half years. And uh, just really wanted to first thank uh, Christine, uh, who is, who's been the admin support on Edmonton Next Gen for as long as I've been involved, and I think long before that, I think even when you were first there. Uh, and I know the community sort of came forward with a way to, to transition this into a community initiative. So they are already moving forward on this work. Um, they've been out and about, they're doing some really cool things right now as we speak. Um, even though it's not quote unquote part of the city of Edmonton, it is still a, a very important part of the city of Edmonton. And so I just wanted to make sure we recognized everyone who had been involved on that from uh, from yourself, Mr. Mayor, and everyone else who had been involved at the very beginning to all the volunteers who have been involved uh, throughout because this, this one was a really special initiative. I enjoy the work they're doing. I know that they're going to be doing a lot of the similar work and they're going to be doing some very interesting new things and uh, appreciate that the city uh, and Min also helped provide them with some support to be able to sort of hit the ground running. And so they're not starting from scratch. They're already formalized, they've already been working on their partnerships and, uh, and already out there supporting businesses and communities and, and Edmontonians uh, to continue to make this city uh, a fantastic city for those, uh, not just those 18 to 40 like, the, like they're meant to support, but really everyone throughout. So um, felt I should at least, you know, I, I didn't, don't know the right way to do a send off. Uh, so I thought I'd use a little bit of time to do a send off here. Uh, hope there's still some opportunities, you know, when we get to do the next, when they get to do the next in-person event, it'd be nice uh, as a city, as a city, as an organization that maybe we look at uh, sponsoring or partnering with them on their first in-person event or one of them so that we could do a more formal uh, thank you to everyone who has been involved over the years. So uh, I'll be supporting this. I just wanted to give that acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson, you've got the motion on the floor. Councillor Carmel, if you could take the chair. I have the chair. Uh, just briefly, I appreciate the, the survey work and the responses from members of council. Uh, you know, we've looked at this a whole bunch of different ways, uh, and the initiatives have evolved quite a bit over, I think, 17 years. This would be the 17th year. Um, and uh, I, I think it is, a, it is a fair transition question. It's it's not a given that council would even appoint any uh, members. That that's something that resets with each election. Um, uh, given that there will be some amount of turnover, I, I do think it it makes sense for the new council uh, to to take their time with with deciding this, uh, uh, where the ones are up for further discussion. I think. Uh, you know, there are some that will always be work because they're very much front and center in the traditional jurisdiction of the city or they're very well aligned with particular elements of city plan, for example, and where it makes sense to, uh, to um, I was going to say deputize, but that always gets tricky, um, to empower uh, councillors to take leadership, which I will say as mayor uh, has been really helpful in many instances. Uh, uh, the work on public engagement, which has received international recognition, um, the city can be very proud of, and this whole council can be very proud of, but Councillor Walters 
and Councillor Henderson and Councillor Knack in particular did some amazing work there. I think uh, some of the work that I've been privileged to share with Councillor Essinger and the Women's Initiative uh, has been really meaningful and, and impactful as well. Um, Councillor Henderson's work on winter has changed the way we survived the pandemic. So, um, yeah, I won't I won't go on uh, at length about uh, all of the different initiatives, but but uh, each of you and you know who you are have uh, contributed in one way or another, and uh, that has made the city better. Uh, I think that there is an opportunity for this to continue to uh, to evolve, uh, and would just simply suggest uh, to those of you who may be back in uh, November that, and I'll give this same advice to whoever winds up in this chair, that uh, there, there may be some different ways uh, to do this. And we've talked about um, sort of having um, more properly deputizing councillors in particular ways uh, on particular files. And, and I think that that's worth exploring um, in, in ways that we weren't able to get to uh, in the different times we've looked at it, but it's it's evolving and uh, it's been it's been uh, net positive overall, um, and I think this will put us in a good position after the election for uh, members of council and the mayor to to find ways to leverage the passions and strengths of the the twelve people who the good people of Edmonton choose to send here to do work on their behalf. I'll take the chair back. I'm sure the chair. Um, Councillor Essinger. Thank you, and uh, I'm happy to support this. I, I think some of the council initiative work has been some of the most fulfilling work that I've had to do, um, to be able to come alongside some really strong administration work. Uh, we don't replace what the administration is doing, but where we can lend our voice or champion a cause, I think it allows it to be a deeper experience and to move some issues forward faster. And so I think it's important that as we we look at ending some and, and maybe reconsidering others, we have to see what is our community telling us that we need. And maybe they go from council initiatives to community initiatives in some areas. I thought that was an interesting phrasing. Um, but I think this is important work that adds a level to our work that allows us to support the overwork of the overall uh, city and its people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else before I go to Councillor Henderson to close? Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, it strikes me having, you know, that there's a number of things that I see on this list, either that we were asked to do by the mayor or the previous mayor, um, that probably wouldn't have been here if we hadn't made them initiatives and that have now become part of the way we work. And I think creating space for our future council to take on new things is probably, we need to understand that that was part of what made these important to begin with and not lose that piece of the puzzle. And then I think there's a second category that we maybe need to stop calling initiatives, but that I think are equally important, which are things that we take responsibility for so that we make sure that somebody on council is taking responsibility for them. You know, and I, you know, I think of one that actually predates my time here, which was Edmonton and Bloom, which was an initiative in the true sense of the word when Councillor Fair got it going, and I think Councillor Nickel can speak to this as well. There was a real feeling that it needed even once Councillor Fair left, that it continued to need a champion, that there continued to need to be a councillor who would take responsibility, would be, help be part of the face of it, that that was part of what made it work. So I think as we go forward, and that's why I sort of appreciate that we'll sort of get one more crack at this with this councillor coming back, is understanding those things where we need to make sure that somebody on a future council ideally is taking responsibility for, for some of these areas because the connection to council is necessary. And that's very different from the original conception of an initiative, which was to initiate things. And, um, and probably we need to distinguish those two things. Um, and some of them don't need to be, you know, will not need in the future to continue to have a champion for them because that's really not the role they need to play. So I'm prepared to, I think there's more work that needs to be done here. I'm, I, you know, there's, there's things sort of on the watch list here that I would, I would argue may not be important to hold on to as initiatives, but may be important to say to the next council, somebody should keep an eye on this. Um, and we might want to, in our next piece of work, try to distinguish those things. And that really, it should be to the next council, probably, to say, here's what I'm excited to work on, and go to the next mayor and say, you know, or go to the next council and say, here's something I would like to push forward for, and that'll be their set of objectives. 
Um, and that those that was the first, that was the true meaning I think of the initiatives when they started, and we may have moved away from that. So um, with that being said, understanding we will have one more crack at this, um, I'm fully prepared to support it. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor yeah. Katarina. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Councillor Benga, I th think we've got you as well. Is that correct, Councillor Benga? That's correct. Thank you so much. Councillor Zadek, I may have cut you off there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're just waiting for one more. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. All right, why don't we pause there and uh, we'll come back at 3.45.
good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, roll call, Councillor Katarina. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Zadek. Still here. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. I am here. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. I can't believe it's still afternoon. And a good one. <laughs> Councillor Walters. Uh, he had to step off. He'll come back as soon as he can. Councillor Banga. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Live and on deck. Okay, um, that's enough to get started. So let's resume now on next was 612, uh, which was the Bill 56 um, brief. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Um, just a very brief presentation. So on March 11th, Bill 56, the Local Measures Statutes Amendment Act 2021 was introduced by the province. The changes that were introduced through the release of the 2021 budget are enabled by Bill 56, Local Measures Statutes and Amendment Act 2021. There are no additional changes to the MSI capital funding impacts compared to the information previously presented to Council on March 4th after the provincial budget release, but there is some further clarity. Bill 56 also introduces an increase in the monthly 911 levy paid by every Albertan cell, Albertans cell phone user, sorry, every Alberta cell phone user, uh, from 41 cents to 95 cents effective September 1st, 2021. This levy will help pay for new federally mandated 911 technology upgrades. The new next generation 911 technology upgrades must be in place by March 20th, 2024. It allows for texting to 911, allowing domestic violence victims a safer way to reach out for help. We will work with the province to determine the additional funding that might flow to the city to help fund the required technology upgrades for the 911 call center which are currently funded through the 911 levy. Now I will discuss uh, the infrastructure changes. So as a reminder, this slide includes the MSI changes introduced in the 2021 provincial budget. This is the same information that we, was shared with council on March 4th during the provincial post budget discussion. Although Alberta municipalities are receiving more funds than anticipated in 2021, there is a fairly significant reduction starting in 2022. The top portion of this chart reflects the MSI capital funding available to the entire province and the bottom part of the table reflects the estimated impact to the City of Edmonton's MSI capital funding. The information in the top portion of this slide uh, for all of Alberta is the funding of MSI for 2021 to 2023 and the, LG, the LFGG funding for 2024. And this was confirmed through Bill 56. The City of Edmonton funding is still an estimate as there was no further details provided in the bill in terms of funding, but the overall um, amounts were confirmed. How the percentage allocation of the LGFF funding to the City of Edmonton and the City of Calgary was confirmed for Bill 56 and I'll explain that on the next slide. So this slide specifically shows the changes to the LGFF which were a part of the overall capital impact shown on the previous slide. Overall, Alberta municipalities were expecting to receive a total of 860 million in funding starting in 2022. That has now been reduced to 485 million in MSI funding, a reduction of 375 million, which does not include the front end loading on the last slide. Of the 186 million originally committed under the Local Government Fiscal Framework Act, 455 million was for Edmonton and Calgary, and 405 million was for the other municipalities. So Edmonton and Calgary's portion was originally 52.9% of the overall funding available. The bill confirms that the LGFF will start in 2024 with an estimated 722 million in funding for Alberta municipalities. So we're a reduction of approximately 138 million. Uh, less than originally anticipated, and it is two years later than originally anticipated. 
The bill also confirmed that Edmonton and Calgary will receive $382 million of the funding, maintaining their percentage at 52.9% of the total funding available. So with that, those are the summaries of the bill. So with that, I think we're just open to questions. Thank you. That's helpful and timely. Uh, Councillor Henderson, you'd selected this. Uh, I think I selected it. I, I did because you suggested it needed selecting because it was a verbal report. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, okay. Okay. So you didn't have questions then? I, uh, you know, without having heard the report, I, I, I guess, I guess very quickly is, is there new, I, I, I didn't see anything particularly new from what we knew a week or so ago. Am I missing something? It just confirms that the, the, the funding in the budget is yeah. confirmed in the bill simplistically right. for, for infrastructure purposes. Yeah. But it does introduce the 911 was a new, it wasn't, yeah. that actually wasn't discussed no. in the budget. And, and that, that's, but that's, I mean, will that have impact on us? We still Owning have our to, own cell phones, right? Yeah, and, but we will have to see because we're the ones who actually affect some of the changes to the 911. So we'll have, it'll, so an, it'll have an expense piece for us. Ideally, we would have a revenue and an expense To go with the expense, and hopefully they will match. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Um, and, then, and then, so the real effect for us is on our neck. Would this, this will hit with the next four-year capital then, really. That is correct. Answer. That probably for this year and next year, we're a little bit down, but it's not hugely down. That's correct. We're a bit up this year, down next year, and then we're into the next four years. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions? Councillor Knack? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I, I know we talked a little bit about this last time, but just to dig in a bit further, we, we still haven't received any type of information uh, explaining the the delay in LGFF, which which was finally meant to provide some type of long-term certainty, similar to the fiscal framework, which was uh, at once approved and then subsequently removed, correct? That's correct. Okay. And and so with this revised amount, so just to make, so the idea was if, if it had started next year, part of what happened in each year is that it would go up or down based on, not at the same level as the province, but it would go up and down uh, to 50% of the impact um, in, into the economy, right? So essentially we'd be tied a little bit to, to the economic performance of the province and it would go up or down from 455 from the Edmonton Calgary numbers, correct? That's correct, Councillor. And we did not see a change to the formula, the, the last formula in this amendment. Okay, so the 382, so that's what I guess I'm wondering about how, how can they already, so if we were starting at 455 next year, there'd be no certainty that we'd be down to 382 in 2024, correct? We, we, would, we would be going up and down, for, I'm using the, the Edmonton and Calgary numbers combined, but essentially 2024, we wouldn't know for certain but it feels like a stretch that we'd be dropping down that low over two years. I mean, the economy would have to continue to be in a very terrible shape to be there. So it feels like we're starting off at a lower point come 2024 than what we would have expected under the, the current or the previous plan. That's correct, Councillor. Okay. Any insight as to why that change is being made? Because that, that to me, like... Fine, if we're going to wait two more years for some type of long-term stability, I guess, but to start at a lower mark feels very challenging because we were already, and again, we'll get a report that shows the cumulative impact, but we've taken cut after cut after cut after cut. This is one more starting at an even lower level than what we were expecting on at. That's correct, Councillor. The only indication we have is in the budget documents itself that just say they can't afford it at this particular moment, and therefore it is pushed out two years. Mm -hmm. Pushed out two, but it's not just pushed out, it's pushed out and cut two years from now. That's correct. Yeah, which I think is a really important distinction. If, if it was just being pushed out and we were going to start at that same amount as originally projected, that that's one thing, but to then get another cut on top of these this major series of changes is, is something else. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I don't know. I'm just curious if you've heard anything around, you know, why it sounds like Kamin hasn't heard anything from the administration politically. Have you heard anything about why a they're waiting two years to give us the stability that we've been looking for for some time and then B why they're starting us out lower than what was originally projected? Well, <clears throat> 
I think this is the fiscal reckoning we were promised. Promise made, promise mm -hmm. kept. Yeah. And and there has been no uh, updated conversation saying, okay, if, if if yet again we'll take another cut starting in 2024 to reintroduce the the 100% uh, amount where we would share. Uh, together in the benefit in full uh, versus the 50% that we're doing now, right? I, I mean, I made that suggestion to the minister as a way that they might soften the blow of this was by providing municipalities with uh, nearer term, larger upside in the recovery in exchange for the deeper cut. Um, but it, it was a suggestion, not a negotiation, because we were not brought in to discuss what the implications would be for municipalities, jobs, the economy, any of the other impacts to this. We were simply informed of what the changes would be after 10 years of negotiating <laughs> the, the okay. input factor. No, all right, uh, thank you. I guess, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any, <laughs> that'd be a nice suggestion to once again run by our new municipal affairs minister and maybe something we can talk about through AUMA. I, I, I do think he's meeting. open, I do think he's open to the conversation about the escalator. Um, so I think it's worth, I mean, it's worth putting some markers down on these issues and providing some feedback. I, uh, so, so I mean, it, it, there is now that the budget is tabled in the legislations here, there is now room for, to engage and I, uh, so I, Notwithstanding my frustration, I, I do think that we sh we should continue to press for for what would be fair under the circumstances. Okay, I, I'm out of time, but I'm wondering: do, do you need a motion to that effect to help with that advocacy work? I, it couldn't hurt. I mean, I think we'll 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 work and we'll work with AUMA and with Calgary uh, and with RMA, uh, and I know you're involved in that work too. But I don't think it hurts for council to um, provide specific be feedback on. Uh, Bill 56 and specific suggestions about uh, what what could still be done to improve uh, our situation medium term. Okay, uh, that that sounded like a fairly good. <laughs> I, I might want to borrow that, but I'll I'll wait for a moment, see if anyone else comes on, because I feel like I could make a motion somewhat to that effect. Okay, well, let's see if there are any other questions. Not seeing any, um, go ahead then with a the motion. So, <laughs> having not uh, not got to plan any wording, uh, this is a little bit on the fly, but I recognize this is our last, I think, in, in public items. So, uh, it would be something along the lines of that um, the city council uh, asked the mayor uh, to work together with the city of Calgary, AUMA, RMA, um, or advocate to the provincial government on, uh, related to Bill Fifty Six. Tied to to to, um, to address the escalator portion of the local government fiscal framework, I would also somewhat argue I think timing is still an important piece. But yep. no, I think we can make all the points about the the impacts of this. I wouldn't limit it just to the escalator. Would be my advice. Okay. But yeah, I feel like I just I haven't had a chance to write anything down, so I don't know if we want to come back to it later. I can work together with administration on that. I, I think I think we want to express concerns and provide feedback on on the legislation as it relates to the fiscal framework and impacts to uh, the city's capital plan. Sounds and much simpler than what I could have probably created. So maybe we'll just move that. So we've just got that the mayor on behalf of city council work with the city of Cal Calgary, AUMA, RMA to advocate to the province regarding Bill 56, including the impacts of the fiscal framework on the city's capital plan. That sounds wonderful. I'll move that. Okay. I'll second that. Uh, seconded by Councillor Katerina. Any questions on that? Not seeing anyone, anyone wishing to speak? Councillor Knack to close. Uh, yeah, just briefly, Mr. Mayor. I, again, I sort of expressed my frustration somewhat through questions already, so I think I've made my point somewhat known there. Um, and, and I appreciate, though, that it's probably important for us to do this now specifically related to this bill, independent of the cumulative impacts that we'll be getting at a, from a future report. Um, and happy to bring this forward and, and uh, just because we do have an AUMA executive committee meeting this week, uh, if there's a, an opportunity, it's something that I could raise there because I do think we need to be 
all municipalities should be working together on this because losing that stability and and at this point uh, you know i'm not at all certain that 2024 is going to be the start of this as well and so every year that this keeps getting pushed back it makes it that much harder for any city to be planning uh their budgets and so i mean just step one is actually providing the certainty that i think we need um, that's why we've been doing multi-year budgets it'd be nice to have that certainty from the provincial government and then the second piece is the amounts and, I rec and again i think we all recognize the economic situation that we're in uh, nevertheless it's there is the, been a very large cumulative impact that i think without any type of proper escalator in place um, continues to sort of weigh us down on being able to deliver what we need to uh, because you know we're still we're still growing albeit much slower uh, and there's still a lot of outstanding needs so i think that's why we'll need to do this independent of some of the other cumulative budgetary work thank you thanks can we just get the wording up on the screen before we vote yeah and uh, um the words express concern, I think, are at minimum need to be in there. Uh, uh, in, including expressing concern around the impacts of the fiscal framework in the city's capital plan. We're updating that. Great. Assuming that's friendly, that, that was in what I had read out earlier, so. Yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Okay, please vote. I'm a yes. Okay, thank you very much. We have all the votes. Thank you. Display the vote. Carried. Um, thanks for that. Just a, just a note on the votes. I had a conversation with the clerk, um, and just as we display the vote, we may need to sort of call the vote and then launch the vote because sometimes there's a couple seconds delay in between and folks are um, uh, helpfully um, vocalizing your votes um, uh, because it, the prompt hasn't come up yet, but the prompt hasn't come up for anyone yet. So just uh, um, we'll maybe let you know when the vote is should be up in front of you and if it's not then just because it's starting to get challenging to hear uh who's voting verbally and make sure it's being minuted correctly so just bear with us on that and it's getting tighter um so uh just uh um bear with us on that okay next uh that's 612 uh that's Next up is uh, eight one, Councillor Zadig, and you've got alternate wording for this one. I do. Thank you. Go so I'll, I'll read in the alternate wording. That City Council, in response to the federal government's support of nine eight eight, a national three digit suicide and crisis hotline, and the increasing demand for suicide prevention as a result of the ongoing COVID nineteen pandemic, endorse the creation and implementation of the nine eight eight crisis line. Second. Second. Thanks. A, a, a race to second that one. I'm, I'm not. Uh, was it Councilor Paquet? I think. Okay. I, he was one of them. I heard. Okay. All right. Carry on introducing it. Fastest one to draw. <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll be fairly quick with this one because I think we mostly understand the issue, but I think some context is required. So, for background, a private member's bill. In the House of Commons received all party support for the creation of a national 988 hotline. However, it's not just up to government. The CRTC makes the final decision as they are responsible for the protocols and assignment of three digit numbers. The CRTC has indicated that they will be soliciting input from the public on this number. And this, this year 
However, at this time, no final decision has been made. So municipal advocacy is very much encouraged and needed. And uh, councils across the, the country are, are passing similar motions just to show some support, which then the CRTC will consider. Um, but the, the real issue is that right now there's suicide prevention numbers and hotlines, but they're 10-digit numbers. And uh, the need for someone to, to dial something in a hurry, I think, is important. And I, I was close with someone who actually died of suicide less than a year ago. And he was the type of person that probably would not have that 10 digit number memorized. Uh, but if in the, and he did have some resources before he died, but I think he might've been able to remember a three digit number and use it in his time of need because he definitely didn't want to, to kill himself. I'm sure it, it just was a, something in the moment. So I bring this forward uh, because it's important to me, but we all know how it's important to, I think, almost everyone. And with mental health awareness right now and, and everything else, I think it's uh, reasonable for this council to, to pass this motion, and hopefully we can get a national number. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councillor Zadig. Uh, Councillor McKean. Yeah, I just want to thank John for bringing this forward. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, we do have the support line in Edmonton, but um, bringing something, it'll bring awareness as well as uh, making it simpler for people. We'll probably have a good discussion about that. And it's so important that people uh, find or we remove barriers for people. The stigma, you know, we're working on that. And this is just one more step. So uh, thanks, John, for bringing this forward. Other um, questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Henderson, if you could take the chair. Will do. Uh, what Councillor McKean said. <laughs> and sorry for your loss, John. All right, take the chair back. And uh, any closing comments, Councillor Zadig? Nope. Please vote. We're just sending the vote to you now. Councillor Banga. Councillor Katarina. I verbally, yes, I sent it in. It looked like it went, but... Thank you. Councillor Essinger? Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Paquette? A resounding yes. Thank you. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, please display the vote. And that's carried unanimously. All right. Um... Next would be the private reports, and we can get started on those. We may or may not finish them all today. We'll see how we do. I need a motion to go, on private, to go on private, subject to section 16, 24, and 25 for 9.1, uh, 16 and 24 for 9.2, 24, 25, and 27 for 9.4, 24 for 9.5, and um, oh, 16 and... Uh, 25 and maybe 27 <laughs> for 9.6. We'll see how it goes. Uh, uh, Councillor Walters moved that? No, or Councillor Henderson? Okay. And a seconder? I, there. I seconded. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so to go in private for all of those uh, reports, please vote. Vote's coming to you now. Councillor Banga, we got it. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Yes. Councillor Esslinger. Yes. Okay, we have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. Carried unanimously. All right, we'll take uh, just a couple minutes for.
No. Just a heads up. I had until six. I'm uh, I'm being driven to an appointment. So I will vote verbal. Okay. And I'm on a, I'm on headphones, so no one can hear. Okay. Hear what's going on. Okay, well, okay. We're, we're coming back in public, so it's okay. But thanks for letting me know, Councillor Paquette. It looks like we're going to have to do this uh, virtually anyway. Um, uh, we might be has, able to do it by show of hands. Has e scribe cracked? Has e scribe cracked? Yeah, e scribe is working. If you, uh, just as we're now turning the camera back on, if you just re refresh it, it's working on our end. Might have to log back in. Okay, yeah, I'm it. Okay. We're good, we're good on our end, Mr. Mayor. All right, so the first motion, Councillor Banga, you are going to move receipt of information under 9 1, the major event update. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Second. Sec seconded by Councillor McKean. All right. Please vote. Yes. We're just sending. We're just sending the vote out, Councillor Paquette. We've recorded your verbal. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Councillor Katarina. Yes, for me as well, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Kurtmel. Yes. And Councillor Hamilton. Yes. We're good to go, Mr. Ryan. Display the vote. Carried. I will move uh, the recommendation in 9.2. Thank you. I'll second that. Please vote on the technology update verbal report. The vote's yes. just on its way. Councillor Piquette, we recorded your positive vote. Councillor Katarina. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Zadek. Yes. And Councillor Hamilton. Yes. We are good to go. Display the vote. No. Carried unanimously. The legal update. Someone want to move that? Yeah, I'll move that. Thank you, Councillor Second. Henderson. Second. Seconded by Councillor Essinger. Please vote and keep in private according to the aforementioned four seconds. Yes. Yes. Here comes the vote. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Katarina, did I hear you say yes? Yes. Thank you. And Councillor Paquette? Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote, please. Carried. I'll move uh, the recommendation 9.5 that receive it for information. Thank you. I'll second that. Please vote on receipt of information, city manager update, verbal report. The vote is out. Councilor yes, Paquette. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. Councillor Paquette? Yes. And Councillor Zadek? Yes. And Councillor Hamilton? Yes. We're good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And I will uh, refer 9.6 to the next meeting of council. So we're going to refer that back to administration for further uh, reflection, and there will be a, report, a verbal update at the next That's council. That's exactly meeting. what I meant. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Uh, seconder. Second. Councillor Carmel. Okay. Please vote to refer 9 6. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Katarina. And keep in private still I mean, yes. subject to Section Thank 24 you, in Hamilton. the meantime. Councillor Paquette. Yes. We are good to go. Display the vote. Carried. And are there any notices of motion today? I think there are a couple. Yes, there is. Uh, oh. Go ahead. Uh, I had Councillor uh, McKean, then Councillor Paquette. Mr. Mayor, thank you. I have two. The first is as follows, uh, which will be um, um, notice I'll make at the next meeting of executive committee uh, that the mayor on behalf of city council write a letter to the prime minister asking for the following. One, that the federal government officially recognized the overdose crisis as a national public health emergency. Two, that the federal government fund and accommodate a safe supply pilot program or programs in Edmonton. And three, that the principles of decriminalization within the government of Canada's proposed 
amendments to the Canadian Drug and Substance Act as proposed in Bill C-22 C be enacted in Parliament. The second one, which I will move at the next meeting of Council, is that administration work with the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee to review and recommend changes to the anti-bullying provisions 8.1 and 8.2 in, in bylaw 14614 public places bylaw one to include in its offenses any acts of harassment based on race, religion, sexual orientation or gender identity and two to use restorative justice practices in response to any of those offenses. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McKean. Notice is received on both of those. Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will move at the next uh, City Council meeting that uh, as administration is considering the development of minimum emergency shelter standards and operating requirements that should be expected of shelter operators in order to better support clients and communities, that it also specifically consider the broader need for mental health supports freedom of religious expression, reconciliation efforts, and LGBTQ2S plus rights within the emergency shelter system and homeless serving sector overall. Thank you, notice is received. And um, any other notices today? Not hearing any, then we are adjourned. Thank you for staying a bit late so you can have your Wednesday morning back. Have a good night. <laughs>